Yo Atlas speaking and welcome to part 8 of what if I was reincarnated in the Naruto world as the legendary Kanoha outsider. Let the tale begin. Chapter 141, Jinjutsu Master in the Making What will we be learning today? asked Takuma as he took his Jinjutsu notebook from his backpack. It had been two weeks since Takuma's first lesson with Makoto at her home, and in just that short time, Takuma felt like he had learned more about Jinjutsu than he had known before. That knowledge in no way helped him create Jinjutsu or improve his ability to cast Jinjutsu he knew, but by no means was that knowledge useless. He could feel how the building blocks Makoto was imparting him would one day be of tremendous use as he explored the world of Jinjutsu. Have you ever asked yourself why people don't question themselves in the face of the impossible? asked Makoto. A plate of light refreshments sat between them as usual. What might you mean? Takuma returned. There are jinjutsu which can be created through realistic practical means, but most jinjutsu often lie in the category which can't be created or are near impossible to exist. So, my question to you is, why do we believe the truly bizarre we are made to experience while under the influence of a jinjutsu? Makoto continued, Why can a person see their long-dead loved one appear in front of them and wholeheartedly believe it to be true, and experience the full force of emotions without doubting that the sight in front of them is false? Takuma was left speechless in the face of Makoto's question. He had no answer for it, he didn't even have a guess. In fact, Takuma had never questioned how jinjutsu worked. Before he learned Jinjutsu, Miss Servant Jutsu, the question was never in his orbit, and after he learned it, he simply accepted a Jinjutsu working as a fact. He was sure there was no explanation in any of the five Jinjutsu scrolls he currently possessed. Takuma wondered why he had never questioned it. Was it because ever since Yuhi came had trapped him in a Jinjutsu which brought out genuine fear in him until he naturally slipped out that he accepted it as a universal truth? I didn't know, ma'am. Takuma's curiosity peaked, and he hung on to the next words Makoto spoke. Until three decades, we didn't have the answer as to how Jinjutsu actually worked. The creation of Jutsu, be it Ninjutsu or Jinjutsu, was such a long time ago that much of the knowledge had been lost through the passage of time. We knew that certain series of hand seals and molding chakra in peculiar ways would create Jinjutsu, and the knowledge of creating different effects was more than plenty, but we didn't know how Jinjutsu actually interacted with the brain and mind to cause the intended results. Takuma nodded. Chakra and Jutsu weren't completely understood fields. Just like any scientific field, they too were studied every day by specialists and academics who devoted their lives to understanding the mystic force which made the impossible possible. It could be said that the study of chakra was still in its infancy, used only as a weapon because the researchers were shinobi, and the topics of research were funded by shinobi, making the research topics very biased towards militaristic uses. The only field with applications beyond warfare was iryojutsu which anyone could enjoy. Takuma was sure one day, the secrets of chakra would be unlocked to a level where it would leak into normal lives. As for when that time would come, he didn't know, if the nature of this world didn't change, perhaps he wouldn't see it in his lifetime. The thought made him feel sorry for the world. Makoto continued, however, for decades ago, we developed the technology which allowed us to inspect the brain. It was the invention of the MRI. One of the experiments conducted in those early days was to study how the brain reacted under the influence of Jinjutsu. Oh! Takuma felt excited learning about knowing such a piece of history. The study resulted in us learning nothing. Oh! It was a decade after the initial study that one of the researchers noticed how the scans of the brain of someone under Jinjutsu looked similar to those of people suffering from mental diseases like schizophrenia, Makoto smiled. We simply didn't have enough data when the initial study was conducted, but after a decade of studying all types of people, enough was recorded that previously asked unanswered questions gained answers. Takuma released a breath he didn't know he was holding and subconsciously sat up straighter. He was not a naturally curious person who asked questions, but learning new and interesting things was always a welcoming experience. But then he focused on Makoto's words and realized what she had just revealed. I is there a chance of developing a mental condition because of Jinjutsu, Takuma asked with trepidation. 
neither did he want to get a mental disease, nor did he want to subject anyone to one. Makoto laughed as she hid her mouth behind her hand. She laughed for a good few seconds before calming down. You don't have to worry about that. A few studies have been done, and a correlation hasn't been found yet. Takuma breathed a sigh of relief. To put it crudely, Jinjutsu alters the brain's functionality to something similar to mental diseases, but unlike mental diseases, the user has much more control and freedom. The brain is so disrupted that it loses touch with reality and begins accepting everything you throw at it, just like how an unstable mind accepts hallucinations as reality. Makoto took a pause and picked up her teacup. Knowing she had stopped for him, Takuma wrote everything he had not yet. What about when the target realizes they're in a Jinjutsu, asked Takuma. He had talked to Nenro and others about how they felt at the point of realization, but unlike his experience of complete, instant detachment, their testimonials were different. According to them, they were still very much under the thrall of the Jinjutsu, and it took the effort to muster the intention to break the Jinjutsu. Nenro had specifically pointed out that the amount of effort required to break away depended upon the user's skill level and that if someone was skilled, they could potentially pull the target back into complete thrall after they realized they were under a Jinjutsu. Brain and chakra are complex things beyond human understanding. The brain will try to correct itself, and if gaining control over another's chakra was so easy, Jinjutsu would be everyone's weapon of choice, said Makoto. There are internal and external factors out of your control, which can all lead to the target breaking free. The only way to reliably retain control is to have a strong one from the get-go. Takuma scratched his head with the pencil. Then what are the main criteria for a strong Jinjutsu, its ability to maintain control over the target or affect the target the most? What's considered the strongest Jinjutsu? Mikoto put her teacup down. You're still looking at Jinjutsu as if it's ninjutsu. It is not. I have told you this before. While judging a Jinjutsu, you don't judge the Jutsu but the Shinobi behind it. Let's take your Miss Servant Jutsu as an example, can you change the connection component from visual to auditory? Takuma, of course, couldn't. A true user could make that happen. A Jinjutsu is just a build-it-yourself Jutsu that can be adapted according to the requirements of the moment. Why put in the effort and chakra to create a long-lasting connection when you only need the Jinjutsu to last for a few seconds? Similarly, why cast a strong torturing Jinjutsu when you only wish to detain the target and don't wish to harm them? It's all about managing effort and chakra. How long would it take me to become a true Jinjutsu user, as you put it? asked Takuma. That depends entirely upon. The faster you learn, the faster you'll be able to achieve the goal, Makoto shrugged. As to answer your previous question. The strongest Jinjutsu, as I said, I'll look at the person behind it. What's the quality of the strongest Jinjutsu Shinobi? It's personal preference, and others will give you different answers, but the strongest user would be the one to hold a target in a Jinjutsu even after informing the target they were in a Jinjutsu. Takuma was baffled. How could that be possible? Any person who knew they were in the Jinjutsu would immediately break it. Has there ever been any such shinobi? He asked. The second Mizukage, Hozuki Jinjutsu, said Mikoto with an undertone of respect. It was said that with the help of his summon, a giant clam, he could cast a Jinjutsu so strong that even after informing his targets they were in a Jinjutsu, they would be helpless to break out of it. He could play with a hundred shinobi simultaneously without breaking a sweat. If it was true, then Takuma could see the second Mizukage as the contender for the strongest Jinjutsu user, but he knew two people who he thought held a stronger claim as the strongest Jinjutsu users. Both were from the same clan as his teacher in front of him, and one was her son, Uchiha Itachi and Uchiha Shursui. The former with his Tsukuyami and the latter with his Jinjutsu, of which he couldn't recall the name, only that it was inception on steroids. Takuma glanced at Makoto's onyx eyes. Those eyes were absurdly strong weapons, but what was scarier was that they could become even stronger. So strong that they had made Itachi and Shursui contenders to possessors of the strongest Jinjutsu. But the most terrifying part was that with the right extremely rare circumstances, the eyes could become even stronger. He shook his head. 
It was useless thinking about those two monsters. He didn't know when Shirsui gained his Mangekyo Sharingan and if he had it now. As for Itachi, as Shirsui was still alive, he didn't have access to his Mangekyo Sharingan. A question to you, Takuma. What, according to you, would be considered the strongest Jinjutsu? asked Makoto. Takuma contemplated the question for a moment. My answer might change if I give it more thought. But at this moment, a Jinjutsu that the target wouldn't want to leave is the strongest Jinjutsu, he said. A Jinjutsu the target won't want to leave? Mikoto looked stunned. Life can be tough, ma'am. For many, it's miserable. What if a Jinjutsu gives you everything you desire, a happy life with zero problems? I would bet everything I own that you would find plenty of people who wouldn't want to get out of something like that. He looked outside. Due to the time of day and the building structure, he couldn't see the sun shining. But he could imagine a moon, a full blood red moon with nine black tomo on its surface. A Jinjutsu that gives people the life of their dreams. Takuma closed his eyes, and the faces of his family flashed before his eyes. He wondered if, in ten or twenty or thirty years from now, he could remember their faces, voices, the memories with them, the thoughts scared him to the core. If given the choice, he didn't know if he would be able to refuse. He didn't think his resolve was that strong. He didn't think his resolve would ever get that strong. Chapter 142 Masked Man's Manipulation Located several dozen kilometers outside the official border of the Hidden Leaf Village, a sizable landlocked lake had become the center of the ecosystem for many species living in the surrounding area. The lake wasn't a natural water body and was made by accident by the second Hokage Senju Tobarama during experimentation with water release ninjutsu, which had altered the landscape permanently. Initially, the area was destroyed and deemed too dangerous and unusable for any productive purposes, but in the following decades, the forces of nature assimilated the area, and a rich population of wildlife took it as their home. Since then, the area surrounding the lake was deemed as a wildlife reserve with near zero human activity. At least, that was what everyone thought. Only a select amount of people actually knew that the supposed wildlife reserve was an operational site for the Hidden Leaf's route. The site was the closest to the Hidden Leaf except for the one in the village itself, but the wildlife reserve site was the busiest due to it being the main training site for operatives and was currently the main office of the route's leader Shimura Danzo. On the lakeshore, a roof pavilion stood. Under the roof, Danzo sat facing the lake, silently gazing at the serene scenery. The structure had no security against wildlife, but not a single animal approached despite it being so near the lake, which was the primary water source for all. A masked shinobi fully covered in dark gray appeared just outside the pavilion with masterful stealth like a ghost incarnate. The figure kneeled and waited in silence. If it was a normal person, they wouldn't be aware of the robed shinobi's presence. Danzo hummed from his throat, and the shinobi stood up to enter the pavilion arriving at his side. The parties at the northwestern border have agreed to sit at a negotiation table, said the robbed root operative. They're planning to send the message to the other side in a few days. Danzo glanced down at his hands resting on his thigh. He asked, do we believe they'll reach a common ground? According to sources, the pressure from the skirmishes is slowly becoming unbearable on steam and the entire country, they want to end so they can continue on with their national affairs as normal. Due to Hidden Leaf's help, their efforts are being felt the most currently, and they wish to use their momentum as the leverage before they run out of it. Danzo turned his head to a place on the lakeshore to see a deer step out of the woods to drink at the lake. He observed the deer's cautious approach for a moment until it dipped his head to drink water. He returned to the robbed figure and asked, what if we provide them with the weapons and supplies they need? Perhaps even aid them by lending a couple of our experts for a few weeks. Will they still go to the negotiation table? It's a temporary extension at best. If we extend the offer, they'll soon become completely dependent upon us. Which isn't a problem in itself, but eventually, it will undoubtedly turn into diminishing returns. Danzo had to agree. Since last year, the land of hot water's hidden steam and the land of frost's hidden frost were engaged in a continuous series of skirmishes at the two nations' shared border. It all started when the land of frost, 
traditionally the land of fire's ally, began strengthening its trade and political ties with the land of lightning. It wasn't a problem at the start, but the increased closeness between the two nations extended to the hidden frost and the hidden cloud. The hidden frost was a tier two shinobi village, the great shinobi villages being tier I villages, usually suitable for a nation similarly sized to the land of frost. Historically, the hidden frost hadn't been able to fulfill their nation's request, and thus, had to bring in external help. Due to being allies, whatever request the hidden frost couldn't fulfill, they passed them to Hidden Leaf. While not official, the partnership was all but exclusive. That relationship changed when Hidden Frost opened their unfulfilled request to the Hidden Cloud, reducing the Hidden Leaf's share. Naturally, the Hidden Leaf didn't take the news positively, but they couldn't do anything to dissuade Hidden Frost from giving business to the Hidden Cloud because it was one of the terms in the deal between the Land of Frost and the Land of Lightning. The Hidden Leaf, the only option in the Land of Frost, now had competition in the Hidden Cloud. Having competition meant that the Hidden Leaf now had to match or beat the competitive rates issued by the Hidden Cloud. In the present, it wasn't a problem as the Hidden Leaf had spent years building an image in the minds of the Land of Frost populace, but it was only a matter of time before they would slowly lose a portion of the market share to an equally competent alternative. It was a huge change in, and loss of, revenue, and the business that came from the Land of Frost was not something the Hidden Leaf could shrug off. However, in the end, it was only a natural result of the change in the market, and the Hidden Leaf could still take steps to keep the new player in Hidden Cloud down. The problems began when the Hidden Frost suddenly began attacking border territories of the Land of Hot Waters. Something to know about the Land of Hot Waters was that they were a country that was immensely popular as a tourist destination. The country relied immensely on its tourism industry, and any sort of conflict was a huge blow to its economy as it caused tourists not to choose the country. Another thing to be aware of was that despite being larger than the Land of Frost, its shinobi village, the Hidden Steam, was merely a Tier 3 shinobi organization. Like the country where it resided, the Hidden Steam had strong inclinations towards pacifism. After years of reluctantly offering combat-related services, the Hidden Steam officially transitioned away from the typical shinobi missions, it prided itself as the village that has forgotten wars. The village's shinobi now worked almost exclusively within the land of hot water's borders, keeping the roads safe for tourists and performing odd jobs for the many small settlements around the country. The Hidden Steam wasn't nearly equipped to face an assault from the Hidden Frost and, after a while, lost some of the Land of Hot Waters border territory to the Land of Frost. The Land of Hot Waters had to turn to the Land of Fire for help. The daimyos of the two nations met and conversed, and after their diplomatic talks, Fire Daimyo decreed the Hidden Leaf to aid the Land of Hot Waters. The Hidden Leaf were getting paid for their services and thus had no problem sending their shinobi for the war effort. And while it wasn't known to the public, the leaders knew Hidden Cloud backed Hidden Frost. But now, the Land of Hot Waters didn't think the war was worth the effort as it was hurting the country more than anticipated and wanted to settle the conflict by offering trade concessions to the Land of Frost. They had even asked the Fire Daimyo to act as the enforcer for the peace agreement, who had agreed. If the deal was inked, then if Land of Frost broke the agreement, the Fire Daimyo would pull back aid and roll back trade relationships with Land of Frost which would hurt the smaller cold, snow-covered country a lot, Land of Frost imported a lot of their food from the Land of Fire. And Lord Hokage seems to be in agreement with the course of action, Danzo commented. According to Aruzen, if the Hidden Steam itself didn't want to fight, then Hidden Leaf had no reason to be on foreign land, fighting in a conflict that was not theirs. However, Danzo knew what was truly going on. Hidden Frost was simply a puppet. The true creator of the war was Hidden Cloud, who wanted to break the connection between the Land of Frost and the Land of Fire, so the Land of Lightning could step in and take the Land of Fire's place. If the negotiations went through, then the Land of Fire would be put in an adversarial position against the Land of Frost. It would be like the Land of Fire was saying, do as we say, or else. The Land of Frost, of course, couldn't afford that. Not only was the Land of Fire their paramount trade partner, but that was only until they found someone to replace the Land of Fire, and they just would happen to have a perfect, willing party in the Land of Lightning and the Hidden Cloud. 
they would completely replace the land of fire and hidden leaf until the land of frost didn't have to worry about offending the land of fire. And the land of fire and the hidden leaf couldn't do anything about the situation. They couldn't go and be like, be friends with us, or we will burn you to the ground. That wasn't Haruzen's style, thought Danzo, if it was him, he could have done things differently. Alas, Danzo wasn't the Hokage. If the land of frost were lost to the land of lightning, then the hidden cloud would be able to extend its military line closer to the land of fire by an entire nation. Moreover, the land of hot waters with the hidden steam was worse than a sieve. If the dynamic changed, the land of lightning would be closer to the land of fire than ever. That was something Danzo couldn't let happen. It seems it's time to use the investment we made earlier, said Danzo, gazing at the robbed figure. Where are the survivors of the land of frost incident right now? The figure stayed silent for a moment before answering. Chunin Yumino Iraka is an academy teacher. Jinin Aburame Susumu is out of the village for clan purposes. Jinin Takuma is currently serving in the Leaf Military Police Force. Danzo hummed. He had lost a clan member in the Land of Frost incident. He knew lives would be lost, or else the investment would have been a failure, but he had expected his clan members to survive. It was a true pity. Who was the one to identify that there was a party other than the Land of Frost among the attackers, asked Danzo. They had planted clues for the survivors to come to that conclusion, it was good that someone had picked it up. If they had missed it, the route would have had to implement the backup, which was so much more difficult to pull off. Jin and Takuma. Danzo hummed. It's time, he said. Prepare the new intel report. The official investigation had only been able to find out that the other party was hidden cloud because of the equipment that had been recovered, but the report Danzo was about to give was going to have the names of the shinobi, the higher-ups who had ordered the attack in both hidden cloud and hidden frost, all of it backed up by official documents. All of it was manipulated by Root as an investment. He was going to keep the hidden leaf in the war. For the sake of the safety of the village and nation. Yes, sir, said the robbed figure and disappeared the next moment. Danzo stood up from his seat, ready to leave. He looked to the place where the deer had been drinking water. The deer had been long gone. Standing in its place was a black clothed figure with long hair growing to the back. The figure wore an orange mask. This wasn't a root operative. Danzo went on alert because none of his hidden guards had moved. They hadn't alerted him or come out of the shadows to protect him. He could sense them around him, but he didn't know if they hadn't noticed the figure or if they had been taken out. The figure turned toward Danzo, who noticed that the mask only had one eye hole. And then he saw the red glow through the eye hole. Chapter 143 Interlude Changing Fates Shursway couldn't remove his eyes from the funeral wake arrangement. The photograph they used of his father was taken before the Third Shinobi World War. His father looked young, in his prime as a shinobi, his smile was brimming with vitality, and even the simple photograph could convey the confidence the man exuded, so much different from the image Shursway had of his father in the recent year. The injuries suffered in the war had drastically changed his father, the man wasn't the same, physically or mentally. The Irionin attached to Shursue's father's unit had been killed by the enemy in the same encounter that he had been grievously injured. Even though they had managed to prevail and wipe out the enemy squad, Shursue's father wasn't able to get proper treatment fast enough, and they had to amputate his leg to stop the infection from spreading. Shursue's father's shinobi career was all but over, people who continued on after losing a limb were rarer than a hen's teeth. If it was just that, it wouldn't have been fine, but Shursue's father had taken the abrupt change as bad as one could, soon after, his health deteriorated, and his mind took it the hardest, dementia overtook the once bright mind. The clan had helped and subsidized the treatment. Shursue's father had been a chunin for several years, as such, money wasn't a sore spot even when Shursue's mother was a housewife. But Shursue remembered the earlier days when he had just graduated. Because his father had never activated his Sharingan, he wasn't treated the same as other Chunin who had activated their bloodline limit. Even though they had money, and the clan was helping, that help was only monetary, they didn't have the connections to get the best Irionin to look at his father. 
Only after Sher Shui had become a Jonin was he able to get the best treatment for his father. But perhaps it was too late by then, or else, Sher Shui's father would have been alive today. Sher Shui bowed his head, gripping the prayer beads in his hands tight enough to nearly crush them. Death was part of a shinobi's life, but that familiarity didn't make it any easier to face and accept. Especially when the person was the reason why Sher Shui was a shinobi in the first place. It was clear from the day Sher Shui was born that he was going to be a shinobi, and Sher Shui didn't have any other aspiration, he had only known being told that he would be a shinobi since before he could remember, and he was fine with it. Ever since when he was in the academy and performed well, his father's face would light up. Sher Shui had chased the feeling he had on seeing his father's pride for his ever since. He had trained harder and longer every day, and had not let go of the number one position in the academy until he was the rookie of the year. He had activated his Sharingan before most could pass the Uchiha's rite of passage by mastering the fire release, great fireball jutsu, he had mastered his clan's eyes when most were still awestruck at what a one-tomo Sharingan could do. He had achieved the pinnacle of the Sharingan most Uchiha could only dream upon, knowing that it would only ever be that, a dream. Pinnacle, a bitter arc tugged on his lips. He had achieved the pinnacle most of his clan didn't even know about. The memory of the day he had achieved the historical milestone was in many ways worse than what he was feeling now. He at least knew his father would never be the same as the man he admired and would even pass before his time, but what he had done on that day his eyes had changed was not something he ever thought he would. Sher Shui closed his eyes to calm down his heart which plunged deeper into an ocean of sorrow. He wished to drown but could not let him do so. Sher Shui glanced beside him at his mother, who looked devastated, he had to be strong for her. She was putting on strong front for him just like he was for her, and if she saw her son crumble, she wouldn't be able to hold it together. The years after the war had been far tougher for her than it had been for him. While he could take his mind off using work, his mother had remained at home, caring for her husband every day, watching the man she loved slip away. He loosened his grip on the prayer beads and began moving beads so that if his mother looked, she would think he was holding up fine. The wake had ended, and the guests left, Sher Shui had his mother sent to their only relative's home to rest. He was going to stay the day and keep vigil overnight. Just when Sher Shui thought everyone had left, he felt a presence behind him. He didn't need to turn to know that it was Itachi. A lot of important people from both inside and outside of the clan had come to visit the wake. Not because they knew Sher Shui's father, but because they knew Jonin Uchiha Sher Shui and wanted to pay respects. Sher Shui hadn't spoken to a single person, if the Hokage had visited, he would have not spoken to him. Itachi and his family had taken care of the guests for him and his mother, and for that, he was deeply grateful. It hurts, said Sher Shui, not looking back at Itachi. I could tell that father would never return to his former self, but there was this little thing in the bottom of my heart that refused to let go, the little spark that burned, that father would recover back one day, any day now, and I held onto it tight. He stared at the picture of his smiling father. Losing someone you loved was terrible. War that took them away was terrible. The people who fought in the war were terrible. Shinobi were terrible. He was terrible. Sher Shui stood up and faced Itachi. He stared into Itachi's eyes, they were so young, and yet they knew so much. He knew the story of when Fugaku had taken Itachi into an active battle to show him the reality of war to get rid of the romantic stories that children dreamt of. The motivation was right, but Sher Shui knew it had been too early. And yet that was partly the reason why Itachi was the person and shinobi he was today. There's no use waiting for the Lord Hokage and the clan to broker a peaceful agreement, Sher Shui said to Itachi. With Danzo poisoning the ears of the council and other clan heads, the road to peace has become even harder. They didn't know how, but Danzo had somehow figured out that the Uchiha clan was planning a rebellion, he had used all but accused the Uchiha clan at a council meeting he had called, but he had no definite proof, so he could only point to the recent moves the clan had been making. Of course, without any proof, neither the council nor the clan heads would move, it helped that the Hokage had reprimanded Danzo for what he was trying to do and hadn't hidden it, meaning it had reached the ears it intended. But that didn't mean the various clan and other powers wouldn't safeguard themselves and pay closer attention to the Uchiha. 
Once again, after the Ninetales invasion, the Uchiha had eyes on them. Danzo, being the snake he was, had been going around the village, whispering in any ears he found. There was already tension building inside the village. The problem lay with the Hokage. Their greatest supporter had promised to do everything to maintain the peace between the village and the Uchiha clan, but it was understood by both parties that once the situation crossed a line where that promise couldn't be fulfilled, the Okage would side with the village and protect it, even if it meant turning the entire village against the Uchiha and those who supported them. War was a shinobi's livelihood, but it was terrible, so it couldn't be allowed to burn in one's home. If nothing changed, the Hidden Leaf Village would be in a war with itself. That couldn't be allowed to happen. It's time for me to do that, Shursue glanced down at Itachi. Danzo would keep spreading his poison until he gets the entire village, and the more he does, the more pressure the Lord Hokage will face. We need him to be on our side for the sake of the clan and the village. Are you sure? asked Itachi. I need to give the Lord Hokage the comfort of knowing that the clan won't rebel. Once he knows that, he will be the shield and spear we need. Once I convince him, he will make sure that Danzo can't wrongfully accuse the clan, and once we ensure the clan won't rebel, I can eventually take care of Danzo. Itachi's eyes widened as Shursue's eyes changed to a pattern unique to him. If he doesn't stop, I'll make him silent, forever. Shursue had held on to the hope that one day his father would recover. So, he knew the truth that it hurt. Hope hurts. If he wanted something, he needed to take it on his own. Fugaku sat in Asaiza in a secret clan basement of the Uchiha clan. Around him sat other leaders and elders of the Uchiha clan. He could sense their confusion as he was the one to call them but hadn't given them the reason why they had been called to such a hastily scheduled meeting. Fugaku, why have you called us all here today? asked one of the clan elders. Ever since Danzo had begun spouting his mouth off, the clan meetings, which were mandatorily attended by everyone who was free now, were done in shifts not to attack attraction in case someone was watching. It was risky for them to give clues that they were planning something. But today, Fugaku had called all of the leaders, breaking the protocol he himself had established. Shursue has some important information, Fugaku addressed the people gathered. He has some important information regarding a recent meeting between the Lord Hokage and Danzo. He wanted everyone to be here before he shared the information. Fugaku himself didn't know what Shursue wanted to talk about, but if Shursue, an ANBU member, had considered the information to be sensitive enough that it could only be discussed in the deepest underground basement, then he wasn't going to argue. Everyone turned their head towards the dark staircase, the only entrance, to the basement. Shursue appeared after a few seconds. He was dressed in a casual blue samu and was slightly drenched. It seemed the rain had begun pouring since they were underground. Is everything all right, Shursue? asked Fugaku. Shursue gazed at the people in the group before facing Fugaku and nodding. Fugaku observed Shursue. It had been a month since Shursue's father had passed, and he could still see that the death still weighed on Shursue's mind. What did you want to tell us, boy? asked the same elder as before. Shursue looked at the elder for a moment before stepping forward and sitting down, facing everyone in the room. The Lord Hokage knows about our plans, said Shursue. Fugaku's eyes narrowed, and the sound of sharp intake filled the room as everyone sat straight at Shursue's words, who gazed at everyone for a moment. He has known since last year. The reason he has been trying to reach out to us is in an attempt to stop the clan and fix the relationship. Fugaku's mind started to race. There were a hundred questions that suddenly became a matter of utmost concern. If the Hokage knew about their plans to overthrow the government, then every single clan member was in grave danger. He needed to change. I thought perhaps if the village extended their hand, perhaps the clan would let go of their plan, said Shursue. Fugaka gazed up at Shursue. The way Shursue had said that had some very specific connotations. Before he could speak up, Shursue continued, but I now believe that it's too late for our clan. We can't go back. Everyone in this room has made up their mind, and everyone else will follow whether they like it or not. But, if I can change the minds of everyone here, I can change the direction of the clan. A bad feeling settled deep in Fugaku's stomach. 
Shirsue's words were ominous. It was clear that he had revealed the clan's plan to the Hokage and had put the entire clan's safety and future in jeopardy. Shirsue. Fugaku's words died in his throat when Shirsue looked up, and the Sharingan glowed in a dim room lit by oil lamps. But then the familiar three tomo design changed into something Fugaku had never seen before. Itachi hates the mandatory meetings. But I'm glad that when I said it was mandatory, everyone showed up. Eshersue, what is that? Shursue Sharingan had turned into a four sided pinwheel. Everyone in the room dumbly stared at Shursue, but they looked like every nerve in their body was tense as if ready to move at a moment's notice, but they didn't and simply stared into the different eyes. Our clan's cursed, said Shursue, his laugh was deeply hollow. These eyes demand a terrible sacrifice for its power. Do not worry, elders, I made the sacrifice once, and I can make it again. For the clan's sake, for the village's future, I will make this sacrifice, I will carry the burden. Before Fugaku, or the others, could do or say anything, pressure descended on their head. As they stared into Shursue's eyes, which slowly rotated, they felt as though their bodies had been detached from their control, and all they could do was gaze. It's okay. You will not remember this. When you open your eyes next time, you'll have a different worldview, said Shursue. Do not worry, I will not cripple the clan. I agree that Uchiha needs strength, but we don't need to ruin the village to get it. The Uchiha will be strong, and the Hidden Leaf will appreciate the clan for it. The last thing Fugaku saw before his vision turned black was a tear slip down Shursue's cheek. Chapter 144 Ninja Gains A big group of shinobi sat around in the thick bushes deep within the lush green forest that spanned hundreds of kilometers. They sat in silence, tending to their weapons, checking their ghillie suit, and applying face paint and insect repellent in preparation for the task that had made them travel so far from the Hidden Leaf Village. Nenro glanced at the three shinobi teams, including his, participating in the current mission. Until two months ago, he didn't believe he would be traveling outside the Hidden Leaf into a deep forest away from most civilization for a mission, usually, shinobi worked near towns and cities where their clients resided, but for the current mission, they had been hired to go deep into the forest. The client? Ninro looked to his front, where his friend Takuma sat on the ground with his legs crossed, observing a rough map of the area that they had drafted in the jungle itself in the past three days. Eight months back, Takuma had told them that he had been given the command of a small team in the police force, but if Nenro had been told that eight months later, Takuma would be recruiting him for a mission on behalf of the police force, he would not have believed it. After all, Takuma was an outsider in the police force, a genin at that, even if he was placed in a great position, there was a limit to the freedom he would have in the Echiha home ground. Do you understand this, Masaki? Takuma said. Nenro glanced to the right where Masaki, his hometown friend and roommate, was squatting and squinting down at the map. No, Masaki replied. Takuma didn't look bothered, instead, he asked Masaki what he didn't understand and explained that part of the plan of action once more. Nenro wasn't the only one, Takuma had contracted Masaki as well to participate in the mission. Technically speaking, the Leaf Military Police Force's jurisdiction encompassed all the hidden Leaf shinobi, current and, in some cases, even retired, meaning no matter where the shinobi were, they could have a run-in with the police force if in suspicion of violation of the law. But, in reality, the police force only operated in the Hidden Leaf and some areas around it. They couldn't stretch their hands more than that as they didn't have any of the manpower to do it. The Uchiha was but one clan, and even with their allied clans, they only had enough people to cover ground inside the Hidden Leaf, which had the highest density of shinobi of any place in the world. However, situations arose when the police force needed to operate outside the Hidden Leaf. In those cases, the police force would recruit shinobi to assist them, as generally, they couldn't spare officers for excursions outside the village. This was one of those situations. Nenro and Masaki and their respective teams had been recruited to aid the police force for a mission outside the Hidden Leaf. What do you think, sirs? Any suggestions that you would like to add, said Takuma. Nenro wasn't surprised that Takuma had recruited two teams, as there was plenty of precedent for it. 
the point of surprise was the composition of the two teams. In the circle sat the Chunin team leaders of Ninro and Masaki's team. They observed the map as well and worked for the past three days to draft it and construct the strategy based on it, along with Takuma and all three teams. It all started when Takuma came to Ninro and Masaki with the proposition of a mission outside Hidden Leaf's borders. He told both of them that he needed two teams and had come to them because they were his friends. Takuma didn't just want them, he wanted one of the Chunin Ninro worked under, and he wanted to exploit the Akimichi connection through Masaki. He explicitly told them he needed a Chunin leading their teams and wanted them to bring a Chunin who wasn't arrogant jerks and would be willing to work together without their egos getting hurt. Takuma hadn't told them any details about the mission, he wanted to meet the Chunin before revealing anything. That wasn't common, but it wasn't strange, it was the police force, and they might want to keep details confidential until a few things were finalized. He and Masaki went to the Chunin they liked working with and presented them with the possible opportunity for a mission collaboration with the police force. It wasn't difficult to get the Chunin interested when the police force was involved, and it only took a few days to set up a meeting. They thought Takuma would be bringing a police force Chunin to the meeting, but when they arrived, Takuma was the only one there. There was no police force Chunin, Takuma was leading the operation. It was then that Nenro realized why Takuma had asked them not to bring someone with fragile egos. It was going to be a police force mission, and with no Chunin involved, Takuma, a Jinin, was the highest authority they would be technically working for him. Nenro did not think the meeting would go successfully, but surprisingly, Takuma sold the mission so well that the Chunin agreed on the spot, knowing the stipulation that Takuma had the final say in any and all matters. He had managed to convince a Chunin from a shinobi family that Nenro invited, and the Akimichi Chunin Masaaki had brought along with him. Only after the Chunin agreed did Takuma share the mission details. They were going to hit a big drug farm and laboratory, which was known to be the source of an in-demand stimulant currently popular in the Hidden Leaf. Shinobi confrontation was expected, making it an official B-Rank mission. B-Rank mission Ninro hadn't been on a B-Rank mission. He had done C-Rank missions in high double digits, but a B-Rank mission wasn't something even floated to him. He was well-liked by all the Chunin he worked for, but his background as an outsider from the Hidden Leaf hindered him, he hadn't ever been considered for a B-Rank mission by any of them. But Takuma brought him one, and more importantly, Takuma had made it so that Ninro was the one to pitch it to a Chunin. That was big. It had a significant impact on his reputation, he could now be seen as someone who had connections in places high enough to get a B-Rank mission. Most B-Rank missions were taken by teams made up of all Chunin and were usually led by a Jonin, Tokabetsu Jonin, or a highly experienced Chunin. Jinin was rarely involved in B-Rank missions because the base criteria for a B-Rank mission was a conflict against enemy shinobi, and Jinin were rarely ever in those situations, the most they faced were bandits, who were trained shinobi. The rare B-Rank mission, which did come by a Jinin without fail, went to the Jinin teams led by a Jonin leader. It wasn't in the cards for Jinin Corp shinobi like them, even for Jinin like Masaki, who was sponsored by one of the major clans. Until now, that is. The current mission was a special one. According to the intel Takuma had, the drug farm was run by a rogue hidden leaf Chunin, missing Nin, and had a number of civilians who were trained in chakra, making them Jinin equivalent, protecting it. Two Chunin and ten Jinin were a suitable mix of people to take care of the farm while the situation still qualified as a B-rank mission. Moreover, the missing Nin was in the hidden leaf bingo book, making it attractive for the two Chunin who could claim the bounty on his head if they apprehended the missing Nin. It was one of the centerpieces of Takuma's pitch during the meeting with the Chunin. Looks right to me, replied the Akimichi Chunin. The man was short, but big in the way that every Akimichi was. I have no problem as well, said Nenro's Chunin leader. Even though Takuma was the client and the mission leader, he naturally had to give up some authority in the presence of two Chunin. But if Ninro was asked, he had done it magnificently. Takuma had made them feel respected, made them feel valued for their experience, and had used their suggestions and advice every step of the way, it not only made sense from a team synergy standpoint, but it was also common sense to listen to more experienced shinobi. 
Takuma had kept his position as the leader, someone who listened to his team's opinions and incorporated them into the strategy, allowing the team to feel they were being valued. And finally, Takuma had 100% left the missing mean to the two chunin. They could approach that problem in any way they wanted without any real intervention from him as long as they got what he wanted, the drug farm shutting down and more than enough evidence against those involved. How do you feel, Takuma? Your first B rank mission, and you're leading it. I don't think I've ever known a Jinin to be in this position, asked Nenro's Jinin, smiling. Takuma looked up from the map and lightly shook his head. Not my first B rank mission, sir. Everyone was surprised. Even Nenro and Masaki. Takuma continued, I was involved in the Land of Frost incident. The investigation closed last year, they categorized it as a B-rank. Takuma chuckled, which sounded hollow to Nenro. This will be my second, and I sincerely hope everything goes fine this time. Nenro looked at Masaki, who shook his head. Takuma hadn't told them that the investigation had closed. Currently, the land of hot waters and the land of frost were at war against each other, the latter being the aggressor. But the truth of the matter was much bigger, the hidden leaf was supporting the hidden steam while the hidden frost was being backed up by the hidden cloud. The hidden leaf and the hidden cloud were engaged in a proxy war against each other on lands foreign to both. The two great shinobi villages weren't officially at war against each other, but people understood that the two superpowers were currently going through a simmering conflict under the guise of supporting their smaller allies. Nenro wondered if the Land of Frost incident factored into Hidden Leaf's current stance. He would have to ask Takuma about the details later. The sound of chimes sang, and immediately everyone stiffened up and took out their weapons. They had laid wire traps that pulled on bells to alert them in case someone approached vicinity. They could hear the sound of footsteps and the rustle of bushes, and the tension rose until they heard a sharp whistle that calmed everyone down. A moment later, three jinin appeared into view. One each from Nenro, Takuma, and Masaki's team. They were the scouts. How was it? Takuma asked his teammate, Minoru, a sensory nin, a valuable asset to the team. Nenro was surprised when Takuma told Minoru he worked for him as part of his team. He realized he didn't know much about what Takuma did in the police force. A valuable asset, thought Nenro as he looked around. A B-rank mission was a huge thing for a Jinin, so when Takuma told the Chunin he needed three Jinin each on their teams, it was clear that the Chunin would try to sell the precious chance to have a B-rank mission on their resume to the highest bidder. It was an open secret, something Nenro was sure Takuma had anticipated. Masaki's Chunin had brought along an Akimichi and a Yamanaka, while Nenro's Chunin had brought along an Inazuka and a Yuhi. On Takuma's side, other than Minoru, who was a civilian-born shinobi, he had purchased a Fuma and an Uchiha along with them. Nenro was sure that if not for Takuma insisting that Nenro and Masaki be on the teams, they wouldn't have been able to be part of something like this. For that, he was extremely grateful. It's time, the Chunin is on the farm, Takuma announced as he stood up after taking in the information from scouts. Nenro took in a deep breath before he stood. He had been given an opportunity, he was going to make the most out of it. Chapter 145 The Massacre Didn't Massacre Chunin Uchiakano sat in her office, reading the morning newspaper. Stamped on the front page as the main headline was Leaf Military Police Force's most recent roundup of one of the prominent ecstasy gangs operating in and out of Hidden Leaf. It was a glowing article praising organized crimes work isolating the network of people involved with a mid-sized drug cartel. She had gotten used to seeing such articles once a month since the narcotics team's inception, now a fully funded task force, nine months ago. The team of Jinan had all but launched a crusade against drug organizations in the village. Almost every week, without fail, they had made important arrests, their momentum had only risen from the day he had made their first big arrest. Kano searched for a particular name in the article, but just like always, it didn't have a single mention in the article. The source of the article was simply stated as an officer in organized crime along with official comments from the office of Jonan Uchihase Yuri, the head of the organized crime department. But she knew the source was Takuma, the supervising officer of the narcotics task force. 
After Takuma had taken his new position as the leader of the new team, his supervising officer changed from Kano to Yakumi, her boss. As such, Takuma no longer worked directly under Kano. She was still at a higher rank than him as a senior officer, but the chain of command had changed. The Department of Organized Crime did have a role in what went out to the media, but as far as Kano knew, the Narcotics Task Force personally handled their own media communication with a simple external review process before anything went out. It was Takuma's decision to keep his name out of the newspapers, he deliberately directed attention away from him by putting a prominent jonin in the spotlight. And no one except for Setsuna had complained about it, who was in charge of the new recruitments and wished to use Takuma's recent success as the poster boy for the second batch of recruits, but Takuma had ensured his name stayed out. From what Yakumi had told her, Takuma had established exclusive relationships with a few journalists in the Hidden Leaf. Every newspaper, radio, magazine would get some information from the narcotics task force about their latest accomplishments, but Takuma would share a little bit extra with his journalist friends and, in return, those journalists would put the achievements front and center and paint them in gold. By no means was it a new practice, but Takuma had been quick to utilize it from day one when usually people like him, in charge of new initiatives, would try to put their name out extensively on every success. Kano didn't know why he did it, but Takuma had been particular about what went out to the media. If she had to guess, it was because he didn't want to attract the envy of the people in the police force. Even though he wasn't attracting attention, the results had definitely been noticed. The Narcotics Task Force's recent request for an increase in the budget had been approved without much resistance, even though there wasn't a single senior officer or even a chunin on the team. Even Yakumi, who was associated with the Narcotics Task Force, wasn't actively involved in the day-to-day -day operations. With the popularity and results of the task force, many senior officers in organized crime had tried to get themselves placed as the leader in charge of the task force to get credit for the work and set themselves up in a favorable situation, but shockingly, they had been unsuccessful. It's because of him. All of it is directly tied to him, all the information and contacts. Everything comes from him. Yakumi had told her when they had gone drinking after work. Takuma was the only one connected to his confidential informants who were the source of all information. Without Takuma, the task force would need to go through an overhaul and would need to figure out an alternate method of operation. That would require a lot of work, and anyone who was in charge would be under pressure to bring things back up to speed and be blamed when they failed. Takuma, seemingly aware of the fact, had leveraged it to keep his position as the one in charge. It was a risky move that would have offended many, which it had, and would have caused him to feel a lot of heat, but Takuma had been able to retain his position. Jonin Sayuri had herself stopped entertaining any talks about a Chunin or Jonin to be put in charge of the narcotics task force, and there was even gossip that the orders had come from the very top from Chief Fugaku, who, according to the internal office chatter, was helping Takuma because he was her wife's student. But as far as she knew, they were only rumors because that situation was supposedly about to change. According to the gossip floating around, the narcotics task force was growing too quickly. It was on the verge of becoming too big for a jinn to lead, it was becoming too big for an outsider to lead. It was inevitable that the higher-ups wouldn't let that happen. Kano sighed as she closed the newspaper. She had no desire to get involved with the narcotics task force, she was happy with her current position, the perfect balance between active field work and managerial duties, just what she preferred. But, she was sure somewhere behind closed doors, people were engaged in talks, especially right now, as Takuma was out of the village on a very important mission that could be disastrous for Takuma if it failed. It didn't help that the clan leadership's sudden change to the goal had sent a shock throughout the clan. The Uchiha clan, which just a few months ago was planning and working towards overthrowing the village's leadership, had now abandoned that goal. A lot of the clan was internally relieved about the decision as it meant the potential for a war against the village went away. The reason behind the sudden change had been attributed to the village's recent willingness to work with the clan and the better treatment that had come with it. But that didn't mean everything had changed. If a little bit of better treatment had solved the problem, the Uchiha would have never thought of overthrowing the current regime. Only the final goal had been changed, 
the clan had continued with its preparation and planned to amass power, diversify its presence in the village, build more political allies, and solidify its position as one of the most powerful clans in the Hidden Leaf so that they wouldn't ever again fall to a place where they had in the past few years. In many ways, nothing had changed at all. The clan had simply calmed down a little because they were no longer working towards a radical goal. Of course, not everyone was convinced. There was a group who was dissatisfied with the change and had raised their voices against the change, but with the entire leadership united, which was rare as even there were always arguments and conflict even if they were working towards the same goal, there was nothing the dissatisfied minority could do. Kano could sense a wave of change coming for the Echiha clan, she just didn't know how the Leaf military police force would factor into it now that they had opened their doors to the rest of the village. How are you feeling? Takuma was doing one last check on his gear after the final briefing when he heard the familiar voice. He glanced back to see Arisu staring at him. When the proposal for the one-month trial for the temporary narcotics team had been approved, Arisu was the person he had approached for recruitment. She was the second largest contributor in the Myko Triad case and his closest connection in the police force back then. He wanted her on the team. Initially, she was hesitant. She had a nice position under Kano, and what Takuma was proposing was brand new and thus came with a huge risk of failure. He had convinced her by saying that it was only one month and that someone with her family connections wouldn't suffer if she did something new this early in her career. Luckily, Arisu's parents thought the same, encouraging her to try it out. With Arisu on board for at least during the trial period, Takuma was able to get most of the people on the Myko Triad team and some more who became interested after the success of the Myko Triad. The criteria had been the same as before, only include people who were overlooked for one reason or another. And with office politics prevalent, there were plenty of people to choose from when Takuma was allowed to select from outside organized crime. It had been eight months since the trial period ended, and Arisu was now the second in command of the narcotics task force. There was a risk in staying on, but Takuma believed they had done enough in the eight months to justify that risk with plentiful returns. Well, trying to focus on the current mission, said Takuma. He scoffed, being away from the village has certainly helped to take my mind off things. Takuma and Arisu had grown closer during their time in the narcotics task force. He had come to trust her as his second-in-command and as a friend. So, Urisu was aware of Takuma's thoughts regarding the current situation in regard to the narcotics task force and Takuma's leadership over it. You're overthinking it, they might not take it away from you, Urisu said. He laughed as he turned to her. Let's not kid ourselves here. That's an option. Takuma was well aware of the fact that they had grown beyond what an outsider Jin and like him could be allowed to lead and that very soon, the Uchiha would take control of the narcotics task force away from him and give it to a Chunin who had the most political pull-slash-connections. And that he would be demoted but would still be forced to do the same work he was doing now for the narcotics task force while all the credit went to the new leadership. No matter how much he loathed that, Takuma wasn't surprised that this seemed to be inevitable. In the nine months, Takuma had been running the task force, all of his attention had gone towards making it as successful as he possibly could. Inomoto had given him the information, connections, and dirt on the people he wanted to be targeted, and Takuma had been the most effective bloodhound for him. He had been more aggressive with his decisions, taken risks, and utilized tactics that would have gotten him in deep trouble if they failed, but because they were successful, he had not only made Inomoto happy, but he had also increased his reputation inside the police force. Takuma had gotten a big raise and bigger bonuses, which, when included with his ring's payout, which was considerably larger than before now that he only fought 2v1 and ninjutsu fights, had pushed him into a financial situation that Takuma no longer needed to deal drugs. It was a welcome situation as Ryu, his supplier, had been prickly after the Maiko Triad incident, which would have landed him in big trouble if not for Inomoto, plus, the task force's war against drugs had made Ryo even more paranoid about who he worked with, so getting out had saved Takuma from a headache. Most importantly, he had gained connections and a voice. After the success, 
his higher-ups in the police force were much more willing to listen to him because they had seen the wins he had gotten them and he could get away with some stuff and had even been able to demand more money for the task force, which was rare for an initiative as young as they were. Additionally, because Arisu was his second-in-command, he was even unofficially backed by the Fuma clan, the Uchiha's closest allies. While not a big shot, Takuma was no longer a nobody in the police force. On the other side, due to Inomoto, Takuma had gained a lot of connections in the underworld. Tobi now ran with Inomoto's group, which had made Takuma familiar with a lot of dynamics and relationships among the several groups in the underworld. Moreover, Junior Officer Takuma himself had gained a lot of confidential informants who reported to him in exchange for not arresting them for their crimes. Takuma understood that without Inomoto's information and connections, he wouldn't be able to produce the results that he had, but he also understood the importance of making his own network of people. He not only needed supplied informants known to the entire narcotics task force because keeping his team in complete darkness was not a good idea, but he also needed another source of information just in case Inomoto was trying to screw with him. While they had been wildly successful, Takuma could feel the dynamic change between him and Inomoto. For one, Inomoto did not like the fact that he was so close with the Uchiha royalty through Makoto being his Jinjutsu teacher. And Takuma's success in the police force had put a pressure on Inomoto that his blackmail on Takuma wouldn't work if the police force decided to save their own. So, while Takuma was happy that he was no longer completely subordinate to Inomoto, he had to be careful because Inomoto was a dangerous person. Takuma sighed. He missed when he was a simple junior officer in the police force moonlighting as a low-level drug dealer, those times were simpler times, things had become too complicated nowadays. I don't want to talk about it now, Takuma said to Arisu. Let's focus on this mission. I want this to go well. His experience with B-rank missions wasn't positive, he wanted this one to go well to even the scales out. Chapter 146, Chunin Execution We are going to enter through the west, said Takuma. Takuma's team was the weakest of the three teams due to the lack of a Chunin leader, but he didn't mind it as they weren't going to face a Chunin caliber opponent. Moreover, according to the intel and on-site scouting reports, there was only one enemy Chunin, while they had two combat-ready Chunin on their side. He was satisfied with the people he had handpicked for the mission. Takuma gazed up at them. Minoru, Fuma Arisu, and Achiha Guki. Minoru was a sensory nin who had been of great help during the Maiko Triad mission, and Takuma had actively courted him to join the narcotics task force because he saw the clear value in a sensory nin. While Minoru wasn't that great at traditional police force work, he made up for it when they went on raids by providing intel which kept the raiding party informed and thus safe. Minoru had been the top contributor in verifying the intel and identifying the number of shinobi at the farm in the scouting phase through his chakra sensibilities. Arisu was his academy classmate, partner during their days under Kano, and now his second-in-command. Takuma didn't want to bring Arisu with him because he wanted his second-in-command to be at the office in case any emergency arose, plus, he wanted someone he trusted to be his eyes and ears on the ongoing attempts to take the task force away from him, but when Arisu saw the opportunity to have a B-rank mission on her record, she forced Takuma to take her with him, and when she really wanted something, Takuma couldn't deny it to her because how much work Arisu had done in setting up the narcotics task force. Finally, Achiha Guki, the final member. He wasn't Takuma's first choice for the slot, but despite having autonomous control over the narcotics task force, Takuma still worked for the Leaf Military Police Force, owned by the Uchiha. So, when the order came up from above to include Guki on the mission, Takuma had to oblige. Guki wasn't a bad choice, in fact, Takuma liked Guki enough. Guki was a reasonable man to work with, didn't flaunt his Uchiha status, despite it still giving him privilege, and was competent at the job he did in the narcotics task force. Guki was also one of the two Uchiha who agreed to work under Takuma in the task force, a bold move considering Arisu had been rejected by every Uchiha who she had tried to recruit for Takuma. And Guki hadn't activated his Sharingan. The man was about to turn 17 this year and had yet to turn to gain access to his birthright. From what Takuma had gathered, unlike Hyuga, 
who were guaranteed the Byakugan from the moment they were born, not every Uchiha activated their Sharingan. Every Uchiha was put through the clan's training system and was trained to be elite shinobi from early childhood. They had a lot going for them, a strong clan-wide natural affinity to fire release, the Uchiha Interceptor Taijutsu, which was a top-grade Taijutsu style even without the Sharingan, a rich culture of shinobi training, and envious opportunities for any member who desired them. And yet, it was the Sharingan that turned an Uchiha into a superstar. The moment their eyes turned, they truly became an Uchiha. Everything a clan member got before they activated their eyes, they got incomparably more afterward. The importance of the Sharingan didn't need to be stated in the Uchiha clan, it was felt. As for Guki, his chances of activating Sharingan became thinner with every passing day. Statistically speaking, if an Uchiha was to activate their Sharingan, they did it by the time they were 16, when their emotions were in flux due to teenage pubescence, increasing the chance to activate the eye, which reacted to strong emotions. Guki had turned 17 a month ago, and with every passing day, his chances plummeted. The frontal lobe responsible for planning, organization, logical thinking, reasoning, and managing emotions developed completely by their 25th year in males, and those who were shinobi, or, to be specific, people who practiced chakra, developed their frontal lobe anywhere from 19 to 22 depending on how much they used chakra on a daily basis. Takuma had been learning a lot about the brain in his Jinjutsu sessions with Makoto. The older an Uchiha got without activating Sharingan, the more the chances plummeted of ever activating it. But it didn't matter at the moment. We follow the diamond formation. Minoru stays at the back. I'll be leading the front. Arisu and Guki flanked the side, Takuma said. He sighed as he looked at his team. Before we go, any of you face to Chunin in combat? Arisu's and Guki's hands went up. Minoru looked at them in shock. Takuma continued, which was not a combat exercise. They put their hands down. I'm assuming those combat exercises were a Chunin versus a group of Jinin. They nodded. A piece of advice. A Chunin fighting a Chunin is a different ball game. When shinobi of that caliber fight, people like us tend to become collateral damage. You must keep their presence in mind constantly while you fight your opponent, lose track of them, and you might die without getting a chance to avoid it. In fact, Takuma was the most scared of losing track. He fought in the 2v1 category regularly, won regularly, and because of that, he often feared that his perception might have become limited to two people. But fear was good, it kept him on his toes. Any more questions? he asked. He wanted to be focused on the impending combat before memories started bothering him. Guki said, you should rub some mud to dull the smell before we go. I like whatever you're wearing, but it's too much. Agreed, Arisu added. Glad you like it. I'll give you the name and shop when we go back, Takuma said with a smile, fixing his ghillie suit. Let's move out. The farm they were raiding was a mid-sized operation site. It was the first production site they were targeting, and thus it made this the highest stake narcotics task force had faced to date. The operation was run by a rogue hidden leaf chunin, 15 genin equivalent combatants, and 30 civilian farmers. Leading the rogue chunin to their two chunin meant they were outnumbered by five people, but Takuma wasn't worried about that. They could deal with a few more people, plus, they couldn't allocate any more budget to getting more people. Civilians could be a problem if they decided to stupidly interfere, but the general instinct of a civilian was to run away from a conflict between shinobi, which Takuma was counting on. If they didn't, a couple of explosive tags would do the trick. Try to keep them alive, Takuma whispered as they slowly moved through the thick bushes surrounding the farm. They needed enough people to bring back to the village, but casualties were inevitable. As they reached the farm, Takuma's team stopped and stayed in hiding. Before they could raid, they needed the enemy Chunin to be occupied to clear the way for them. Which was why the two Chunin would move first, and in the commotion, the Jinin of all teams would finally move in. They would be sacrificing the element of surprise, but they would gain a level of separation between the two power groups, increasing safety. The Chunin are on the move, Minoru whispered. Takuma felt his team shuffle behind him. They were nervous. 
He was too, but for some strange reason, their nervousness gave him confidence. They have entered the farm, said Minoru. Boom! There was a large explosion. Hold, Takuma said when he felt them shift. Why? asked Gookie. Hold, Takuma repeated. Minoru? The answer came a couple of seconds later. They made contact, said Minoru. We should move, said Arisu. Hold, Takuma repeated. Why? she asked. Minoru spoke up before Takuma. They're moving north. Go, said Takuma. They were far enough from them. He stood up, retrieved a kanai with an explosive tag tied to its tail, and threw it deep into the farm. Boom! The moment the explosion blew up the crop, they moved in while maintaining the diamond formation. They laid low to give the ghillie suit some more use and blend into the produce for a few more movements. A group is forming to the right, said Minoru. Right, Takuma signaled, and they moved in that direction. A group of five people came into view. They had their targets. The confrontation started when Gookie launched a volley of shuriken toward the group. One of the men stepped forward and thwarted the shuriken volley before alerting his group. A level of competence, thought Takuma, or they have gotten used to the terrain. The people on the farm lived on site for long periods of time because the farm had to be protected at all times, meaning they had the terrain advantage in terms of vision. A kunai targeted Takuma's heart which he easily deflected before abandoning the restricting ghillie suit. He took in a deep breath, and even in the commotion, Takuma could feel his heartbeat. Imagine a mask. Almost immediately, Takuma's focus shot up, and he felt himself descending into a state he was familiar with every time he stepped into the arena. A kunai slipped into his hand each, and he dashed towards the group, who were standing in the two to three formation. The two in the front broke away from the group as Takuma did, one had a machete, the other dual wielded batons. Takuma blocked the two batons with his two kunai and immediately pushed him away with a kick in the stomach. He turned towards the other front man expecting to be immediately engaged with him, only to see the man still two paces away. He glanced at the back three, and they had barely moved. They're not used to cooperative combat, or they aren't used to fighting with each other, Takuma deduced internally. The other front man was slow, but Takuma wasn't going to be a sleeping rabbit. He stepped forward, shifted to dodge the machete, and sliced at the wrist holding the blade. A.H., the man screamed. Takuma shut the man up before his throat could open up completely. A knee to the stomach folded the man over. Chakra flowed through the chakra pathways system until they reached the tinketsu in the elbow. Takuma brought his elbow down at the man's back while expunging the chakra to augment the strike. Takuma held back because he didn't want to break the spine, but he spread the chakra enough to clean the man out of any fluids he held in his stomach. Before the man could kiss the ground, Takuma had already moved past him. He glanced at the man he had kicked away, who was getting up. He launched both his kunai into the man, one to the thigh, second to the same calf. That would be enough to keep him down for a moment. Takuma shifted his focus to the back three. If the front two were resilient enough to get up, his teammates were there to cover for them. He weaved hand seals. The three men immediately panicked, which delayed their next move, giving Takuma more than enough opportunity to get close to them, close enough that they could smell the scent he was wearing. They recovered when they saw Takuma standing there, looking at them with his arms up and his hands in fists. They immediately jumped on him, but before they could land a single strike, it happened. The three men abruptly stopped, their eyes became hazy as they hastily bought their blocks up as though trying to protect them from something, and it wasn't Takuma. Takuma, unfazed, placed an augmented strike on each of them to knock them out before they could get out of the Jinjutsu he had put on them. Jinjutsu, Flower Hill The Jinjutsu made the targets seem like they were trapped in a tornado of petals which obscured everything and made them feel like they were about to be blown away. It obscured their vision and made them instinctively protect themselves from the winds. The downside of the Jutsu was that it only lasted a couple of seconds before it automatically weaned off, but the Jinjutsu made it up with the absurdly strong couple of seconds while it was on. And a couple of seconds was all Takuma needed to knock them out. Takuma sighed and turned towards his team. 
Arisu had knocked out the man he had disabled with his kunai while Minoru and Guki stood over the other man. They were looking at him. Minoru looked surprised, Guki looked interested, and Arisu looked unbothered. Takuma had no idea why Minoru was still surprised, he had taken him on every raid they had been inside the village. Guki was a junkie who liked to spar, Takuma hadn't sparred with him yet. Arisu wasn't surprised because she had been with him the longest. Tie them up, we will go to. Takuma, Minoru interrupted. His eyes were wide, and he was staring at the ground, but he was clearly focusing elsewhere. Another chunin grade presence is closing in on us, and it's closing in quickly. T there are more with, B but they're not as strong. Takuma's eyes widened. He weaved hand seals and pressed his palms into the ground. Earth release, earth tremor sense jutsu. A thrum went out of Takuma's hands, traveling through the ground. A moment later, the waves returned, and Takuma interpreted them. Four people. Takuma looked up at Minoru. One of them has grade two chakra levels? Minoru nodded. Grade two, or informally chunin grade, was the bracket of chakra volume in a person which sensory nin sensed. A jinin could have more chakra than a chunin, but a median was calculated, and the grade brackets were created. They aren't moving quickly. Takuma looked around him. They were in a thick forest, and the foliage covered any smoke the chunin had already created in their fight. We have very little time, but it's enough to prepare. Prepare? Guki interrupted. We should inform the chunin. Of course, we inform them. But we prepare, we can't just stand there doing nothing, said Takuma. He breathed deeply, gather the others, we are going to get everyone involved. They were going to take out a chunin. Chapter 147 Invincible Ninro followed the Uchiha from Takuma's team at breakneck speed. They had just defeated their targets when the Uchiha came running in a second later, telling them that they had an unaccounted enemy team coming in. There's a chunin among them, are you sure? Ninro asked the moment he saw Takuma, a nervous edge in his voice. As he finished the sentence, Masaki's team arrived as well, led by Fuma Urisu. They had similar tense expressions painted with anxiety and unease. Chakra levels confirmed by Minoru, Takuma was sitting cross-legged on the floor, his brows tense in concentration. He glanced at them for a moment before going back to staring hard at the floor. Ninro glanced at the sensory nin part of Takuma's team. He had gotten over the fact that Takuma was leading people from clans like Fuma and Uchiha, he worked in a place with no shortage of those clan members, but having a sensory nin under his command was much more of a surprise. Sensory nin were extremely rare. He was thoroughly glad that they had a sensory nin among them. How can we be sure they're an enemy force, said the Yamanaka from Masaaki's team. The Inazuka from Ninro's team scoffed. Of course, they are. Who else would come to a drug farm? Anyone besides us is an enemy. Despite the rough words, Ninro could tell that Inazuka was agitated from the large brown Ninkin rubbing his head against his partner's leg as though trying to calm him down. The question is, who are they, and why are they coming here, asked the Yuhi on Ninro's team. That's not the question, thought Ninro, but before he could voice his opinion, Takuma spoke up. That's irrelevant. We don't need to know who they're, only that the Chunin among them will wipe us out, said Takuma. But to guess, they're probably a courier team visiting to collect a consignment delivery. That made sense, thought Ninro. The farm was a production plant, and the produce they grew needed to go out so it could be sold. Ninro bit his lip, their luck was horrible. This wasn't taken into account, Akimichi from Masaaki's team sighed, rubbing her forehead with a frown. Takuma shook his head. The delivery schedule wasn't part of the intel package. We are unlucky, Akimichi groaned. Ninro glanced at the people around him. Their expressions were darkening by the second. Everything had been going extremely smoothly to this point, they hadn't encountered a single problem from scouting to capture. The morale that should have been in a high had plummeted to a sinking low. We don't have much time, a few minutes at best, said Takuma. We need to come up with a plan to take them out, or... 
Are you insane? The Anuzuku interjected. At least survive until our Chunin can replace us, Takuma finished. He looked at the Anuzuku, we don't have a choice. We can't run or hide, and we don't know when the Chunin will finish their fight. We have no choice but to engage. Ninro swallowed deeply. Running or hiding would turn them into deserters, and there was no worse fate than that of a deserter, turning rogue would be a better choice than returning to the village if they decided to avoid this. Moreover, allowing the incoming Chunin to go unchallenged would risk the lives of Hidden Leaf Chunin. The priority was clear, the highest-ranking shinobi were to be protected and supported so if everything went wrong, they would at least survive. It was so much easier to replace a Jinin than a Chunin and, similarly, infinitely simpler to replace a Chunin than a Jonin. Everyone in the group knew that, so they realized they had no choice. We are going to ambush them, Takuma stood up. Who made you the leader? Yamanaka narrowed his eyes. Takuma turned towards him with an emotionless stare. Do you want to be the leader? Do you have a plan? If you want to take responsibility, be my fucking guest, but if you don't, shut the fuck up and listen. We don't have time, and I want to survive this. Yamanaka's face twitched. He looked away and didn't say anything. Anyone else? You have five seconds, Takuma looked at everyone, but no one spoke up. Good, now open your minds and listen. The Chunin is the primary target, but before we try to engage him, we need to take out the three Jinin with him. But, we can only spare two of us for three Jinin. Minoru and Inazuka, you two will be responsible for the Jinin. Why them? asked the Uchiha. Minoru is the weakest among us, he has the highest chances of dying against a Chunin, but he will survive a Jinin. Inazuka has his Ninkin, that makes up the numbers in a way, Takuma answered before glaring at Uchiha. Do not question my decisions. I can't keep repeating this, but we don't have time. Only ask if you have doubts about what you need to do. Takuma's voice was tinged with frustration and anger. I'll wrap up the Jinin and join the rest of you against the Chunin, said Inazuka. Ninro appreciated the man's prompt response. It removed the tension and awkwardness before it could grow and allow the conversation to proceed instantly. Takuma seemed of a similar mind as he gave the Inazuka an appreciative nod. The rest of us will be divided into three teams, tank, damage, support, said Takuma. Takuma then explained the responsibilities. The tanks were going to be the team responsible for drawing the attention of the Chunin and absorbing as much damage as possible so that the other teams could operate without worrying about being attacked. The damage team, as the name suggested, was all about dealing as much damage to the enemy as possible, Chunin didn't mean invisible, as long as they got in enough damage, they could theoretically take them down. Finally, the support team was in charge of filling any gaps that would pop up and doing anything they thought would help the other two groups. But as Takuma's explanation came to an end, Ninro could tell that everyone had one question on their mind. Who was going to be on the tank team? It was clear that the tanks were going to be the people who would be suffering the majority of the brunt of the Chunin's damage. They were going to be the people with the highest chances of dying. Ninro thought there would be a spell of silence when deciding the team assignments, but he was proved wrong immediately. I will be a tank, Takuma said seamlessly after his explanation. I will join you, said Masaki. Ninro's eyes widened as he stared at his two best friends volunteering for the most dangerous jobs. He felt a grimy feeling churn in his heart. A terrible scene flashed through his mind as he imagined a scenario where he lost the only two people he cared about in the group. However, Takuma immediately shot that down. No, you're on the damage team. He then turned to Akimichi, I want you to be with me on the tank just the two of us. Takuma, let me come with you. Masaki exclaimed loudly. Shut up, Masaki. Follow the orders, Takuma said to Masaki while staring at Akimichi. I am an Akimichi. The job was made for me, Akimichi pounded her bow staff into the ground. Thank you, Takuma half smiled. His smile went away almost instantly. The damage team, Masaki, Nenro, and Guki, you three are responsible for taking him down. 
Without you guys injuring him, we don't have a chance of surviving this. Don't hold back, but be efficient. I do not want you gas out before we are through this. Nenro, Masaki, and Uchiha nodded. Masaki looked dissatisfied, but he was following orders. Nenro himself felt nervous. He was going through the jutsu he knew and how to use them. I can do damage, said Fumarisu. I know. You're on partial damage duty, Takuma replied. Arisu, Yamanaka, and Yuhi, you three are in support. You guys are going to cover our asses. If someone's in a bad spot, get them out. If you see a chance to attack, you go for it. If one of us gets injured, pull them away. Anything to increase the chance of survival except tanking unless both me and Akimichi are dead. Nenro stared at Takuma. How could he look so calm in this situation? How could he keep barking orders to nine people in such an abrupt situation like this? What was going through his mind? How was Takuma envisioning this would turn out? Did he believe they would be able to survive the upcoming battle? Was it his previous experience that gave him confidence? Nenro had many questions but no way to know the answers. There isn't enough time to formulate a traditional plan of action, so everyone will need to improvise the fuck out of it, said Takuma. For this to go well, every one of us will need to be mindful of our surroundings and each other, if we don't support each other, at least some of us will be dead, and if we don't get back up in time, it's up to all of us. As for the ambush. This is what we are going to do. After Takuma explained the plan, he asked the teams to split up before they positioned themselves for the ambush, but before they could move, the Uchiha spoke up. Are you not scared? he asked Takuma. Takuma, who had half turned away, returned to look at the Uchiha and then gazed at the group. I am terrified out of my wits, he said, but I want to keep living, and that desire for survival is what keeps me going right now. He chuckled, if I'm going to die, then it's not going to be on a B-rank mission out here in the middle of nowhere. I want to die in a warm bed when my skin is wrinkled like a witch, and I have problems shitting, which seems an unlikely scenario in our occupation, but it's nice to have an end goal. And well, there's a disgusting amount of porn in my house, which I would like to be disposed of before I die. Have to clear my browser history before I kick the bucket, if you know what I mean, Takuma laughed boisterously as he said that last part. Nenro didn't understand what Takuma meant, but he had gotten used to it after years of their friendship. Others, though, looked just as confused as he did when he didn't know Takuma as well as he did now. If we live today, Arisu is going to take us all to the best restaurant in the village and foot the entire bill. Gorging ourselves to death is a much better way to go out, Takuma shot a rare grin at Arisu. Sure, why not, said Arisu with a small smile. The situation hadn't changed, but the mood was lightened considerably. Takuma motioned to Akimichi, and the two stepped away to have their team discussion. Despite knowing Takuma had been leading a team for three quarters of the year, Nenro never thought Takuma to be the leader material. At most, Nenro thought Takuma would be a decent manager, but now observing him in the moment, Nenro could tell that even though he was rough around the edges and not as charismatic as some other people he knew, Takuma was definitely a leader material. He sighed before turning to Masaki and the Uchiha. Let's share what all of us can do. We have a Chunin to kill, and it's going to take all we have. Chapter 148 Omiwa Maoshindiru Minoru sat huddled behind a bush. His eyes scrunched in concentration as he opened his sixth sense to the outside world. He was twelve years old when one random day, he suddenly could sense the chakra of people around him. At first, it was so overwhelming that his life was turned into hell. He couldn't control his chakra sense, and they were dialed up to eleven, and in a village teeming with shinobi-like cockroaches, it was literal torture for him. Every waking moment his senses were bombarded with others' chakra emissions. Headaches were all but constant, he couldn't focus on anything, and even the littlest things became Herculean tasks. He didn't know what was happening, and for a week, he tried to push through it, but then he passed by a roadside stall where a group of jonin were having a meet-up. He passed out in the middle of the road and had to be taken to the hospital, where he was finally told that he had the talent to become a sensory neen. 
Minoru wasn't happy about the news at all until he was informed that he would be assigned a teacher who would help him control his new sense. It took half a year to get his ability under control. During that time, he lived on the outskirts of the village, away from the shinobi population and their chakra emission. He was taught to close his senses and, more importantly, regulate them so he could officially become the sensory nin. After his training, Minoru officially became part of the sensory corp, which didn't turn out to be as good as a deal he initially thought. One week after his training, he was called in to be informed that he was transferred to a conflict region on the Land of Fire, Land of Rain border where Hidden Leaf and Hidden Rain, Amage Cure, Shinobi were stationed because of border disputes. Multiple sensory nin were stationed on the border to monitor the Hidden Rain Shinobi and their activity in the conflict region. For three years, Minoru was on the border. At first, he hated it. He was born and raised in the Hidden Leaf and had no desire to live somewhere else but slowly, he made friends and eventually got used to his new life. He became proud of his job, he was protecting his nation from outside forces. But then the news came from home. The Leaf Military Police Force was recruiting, for the first time, the police force was going to be open to shinobi outside the Uchiha and their cohort. Minoru was proud of his contribution and had made friends, but that didn't mean he no longer missed the village. All of his family lived there, and he hadn't seen them once since his transfer. He immediately sent an application, and half a year later, he was officially called back to the Hidden Leaf. He was transferred to the Leaf Military Police Force. Minoru was happy to be home, his family was especially elated at his return and new posting. The new job wasn't as glorious as his previous one. He was no longer keeping his nation safe, instead, he was posted at a police force facility with sensitive information and material. He still used his sensory nin talent, but now he was a security guard at a building. Yes, his pay was better, but he couldn't help but feel dissatisfied with his professional life. But then, Fuma Arisu approached him with a job. They didn't know each other, but he worked with one of her cousins. She told him that there was a raid that could use a sensory nin like him. Looking back at it, Minoru had agreed too quickly. But it had turned out quite well because not only did the raid do some visible good in the village by disrupting the Myko Triad's operation and opening a dozen more cold cases, but it also allowed Minoru to feel good about his job. Ten days after the raid, he was contacted by Takuma, who asked him to join a temporary narcotics team that could turn into a full-on task force. Looking back at it again, Minoru had agreed too quickly but things turned out quite well once again. He joined the narcotics task force under Takuma's leadership. And what followed were the most satisfying nine months of life. They went after actual bad guys, decimated drug trade networks in the village, disrupted money supply to potential illegal operations, they did some real good. And now he was on a B-rank mission. They had faced plenty of shinobi during raids, but this was different. Minoru, update, he heard Takuma's voice from the earpiece. Minoru spread his senses as far as possible. Not every sensory nin was the same, everyone had their strengths and weaknesses. In Minoru's case, his strength lay in his range, he could sense chakra from long distances, making him perfect for places like a nation border, but he also had a weakness, the way he sensed chakra was inconvenient. The higher the chakra emission, the brighter it appeared in his mind's eye. When a shinobi with an enormous amount of chakra was standing close by to others with low amounts, the shinobi with the high chakra could mask the ones with low chakra levels. He had once tried to look at the Hokage's office with his senses, the entire building looked like one big light splotch to his senses. He could tell there were several jonin in the building, but shockingly, the Lord Hokage overshadowed every single one of them. His accuracy was also not the best. The margin of error was quite high compared to some other people he knew. He could judge the bracket accurately, but the exact amount was hazy when the people were far away or were actively suppressing their emissions. One minute at most, Minoru replied. He felt a ripple go through the chakra emissions through half of his allies. They were nervous. He was sure all of them were, he was not good at sensing fluctuations either. But Minoru didn't feel overly nervous. The Chunin coming for them had hefty chakra reserves, 
but their side also had someone with comparable chakra levels. His leader might be a straightforward person, but when he was in combat, he fought like a damn demon. One minute at most, said Minoru. Takuma rubbed more mud on his body to cover the scent he was wearing. Even though it wasn't strong enough to be smelled from a distance, he couldn't let it risk the ambush. Plus, he had an additional vial. He removed his earpiece as it would only get in the way of fighting and began focusing. The front end of the ambush wasn't reliant on him, but there was a chance it could all go wrong and the tank team would need to step up to do damage control. He trusted his allies, he needed to at the moment despite not knowing most of them personally or else none of it would work, but a little bit of skepticism helped everyone. As his father once said, trust, but not blindly. Takuma's enhanced hearing picked up footsteps, and he got ready to blaze out with augmented fists. The entire group slowly shifted in total silence to put the four-man squad within their circle of ambush. Takuma's nerves began to tighten as they slowly tightened the circle. A few seconds later, their targets finally entered the sights. Four men dressed in traveling cloaks came into view. They were traveling in the standard diamond formation, but perhaps they were so close to their destination that they seemed lax. The lowered guard, the no suspicion of mishap, the fatigue from the long journey, the pieces were all advantageous for Takuma's side. They just needed to strike fast and hard to end things quickly. Three. Two. One. The moment the four men stepped into the middle of their circle, the ambush began. Step one. Yuhi would cast a Jinjutsu on the Chunin. The Chunin suddenly stopped and grabbed his head with a groan. Sir, one of the Jinin exclaimed as all three accompanying Jinin took out their kunai. It took all but two seconds for the Chunin to raise his hand to form a Kaihan seal. Step 2 Before the Chunin breaks the Jinjutsu, Yamanaka would use his mind-body switch Jutsu to take control of the Chunin's body. The Chunin's head jerked, and the hands froze midair a moment before they could form the Kaihan seal. Hurry, see can't hold on, the Chunin suddenly yelled in a strained voice. Step 3 Minoru and Inazuka would separate the Jinin away from the Chunin. Minoru and Inazuka leaped out of hiding towards the three Jinin, revealing the team's presence for the first time. Minoru kicked one of the Jinin deep into the forest while Inazuka and his Ninkin dragged the other two in another direction. Chains rattled in his arms as Takuma jumped out toward the Chunin. Step 4 Tank team will move in to restrain the Chunin. Two chains shot out of the forest, wrapping around the Chunin's torso, trapping the arms snugly to the sides. Takuma and Akimichi jumped out of the bushes and tugged harshly on the chain, wishing they could rip the Chunin apart. Step 5 The damaged team will move in for the kill. Nenro and Guki revealed themselves as they jumped the Chunin. They stood opposite each other, weaving hand seals for two Sirank Jutsu. Fire Release, Great Fireball Jutsu. Lightning Release, Lightning Bolt Jutsu. As Guki breathed fire and Nenro shot a bolt of condensed lightning, Takuma felt the chain snap, and the loss of tension made him stumble back. On the other end, Akimichi, too, fell as her chain snapped. He's free! Takuma yelled. The two Sirank Jutsu met in the middle with the Chunin as the target, but Takuma knew the Chunin was free. His eyes darted everywhere to locate the Chunin, every moment they didn't have eyes on the Chunin was a moment their chances of death increased. Takuma caught a shadowy blur. Canopy, he yelled. Suddenly, two white glows erupted from within the forest bushery. Masaki's chakra metal knuckles blazed with his bukijutsu as he pounced like a wild animal toward the Chunin, decking him in the jaw and sending the man crashing to the ground. The Chunin did a barrel roll to mitigate his momentum and stood up with a slight stumble. The travel robe was beyond tattered, and the Chunin ditched it to reveal gear modeled after the hidden Lee Shinobi uniform, but it was modified to be a bit heavier and was made up of darker colors. This was another hidden leaf missing meme. An ambush, and a Yamanaka, the Chunin grunted as he rubbed his bruised jaw. He turned to look in the direction where Inazuka was fighting the two Jinin, he sighed, useless grunts. The Chunin then looked at everyone within his view. Well, you guys fucked your chance, and I'm not charitable to give you another one. 
Takuma ditched the chain and took out a kunai. He placed himself in front of the chunin while Akimichi walked behind him. Nenro, Masaki, and Guki stepped back but stayed in view. Yuhi and Yamanaka stay hidden. Surrender, this is your final warning. I'm not charitable enough to give you another one, said Takuma. The chunin laughed. You all are already dead, he said. Takuma cracked his neck before charging toward the chunin. He slashed for the chunin's neck, but the chunin dodged and grabbed Takuma's wrist. Takuma didn't falter and shot out with a punch to the throat. The chunin laughed as he caught the fist, but his smile vanished when the punch almost made his shoulder pop out of its socket. Takuma dropped the kunai and grabbed the chunin's arm, and his other hand mimicked the moments until Takuma was clenching both wrists. He planted both his feet firmly into the ground and smirked. The chunin frowned and, without warning, slammed his head into Takuma's face. Remove that smirk from your face, boy. The chunin's eyes widened, and he immediately tried to move, but Takuma tugged sharply on his hands to keep him in place. Shing! Thud! The chunin's body jerked as a giant Fuma shuriken struck him from behind, lodging itself in his back. I hope they don't need you alive, Takuma said as he spat blood in the chunin's face. Because I'm going to reap the bounty on your head, and it's going to be dead, not alive. Chapter 149 Utter Evisceration Takuma felt the resistance from the chunin's arms against his grip fade, and relief filled him. The last half hour had been more stressful than any raid he had conducted in the past eight months, they didn't usually ambush chunin like this. Moreover, this time around, he had Nenro and Masaki along with him, Takuma couldn't bear to lose the people closest to him on a mission he had invited them on. Akimichi, help me restrain him. Yamanaka, seal his chakra, Takuma called out. Yamanaka was a novice Fuinjutsu user, he couldn't completely stop the flow of the Chunin's chakra, but he could restrict the flow considerably, making chakra challenging to use. Akimichi stepped forward with a chain in her hands while Yamanaka dropped down from the trees while rubbing his forehead, it seemed the mind-body switch jutsu had strained him. Masaki, Yuhi, go assist Inuzuku and Minoru, Takuma continued. Cookie, check up on the situation with the Chunin, see if they're finished. The team was about to mobilize when the Chunin before Takuma began laughing. Dead, me, the Chunin said to Takuma. You're not going to touch me if I don't want you to. And the dead one will be you, but unlike me, your head isn't worth anything. The next moment, the man turned into a humanoid made from solid earth. The now earthen wrist broke under Takuma's grip a moment before the entire figure crumbled to the ground. It was an earth clone. Takuma's heartbeat spiked as his eyes, only for a moment, went to the others, they looked as shocked as he was feeling. However, that single moment was a moment too much. By the time Takuma's mind ordered him to look for the real Chunin, it was already too late. A hand shot out of the soil behind Takuma's and grabbed onto his leg, and before he could do anything, Takuma found himself being dragged underground. He slipped right in without any resistance because the nature of the soil had changed, but the moment Takuma was underneath, the earth solidified in the blink of an eye, trapping him in a steel grip. Behind Takuma, the Chunin emerged from the ground. He had a kunai in his hand, and he was looking down at Takuma with a nasty grin on his face. He swung down the kunai for Takuma's head, but it never reached as Masaki crashed his body into the Chunin at full force. Fuck! It happened before he could think. He saw the Chunin with a kunai looming over Takuma, and without conscious thought, Masaki leaped for the Chunin before he could harm one of his best friends. It was pure instinct, and Masaki was thankful for them. They rolled on the floor. Masaki's knuckle duster glowed as he dug a punch into the Chunin's chest. The Chunin grunted as he kicked Masaki off of him. The Shinobi immediately got up and faced each other, watching each other's every twitch. You are a strong boy, aren't you, lad? The Chunin smirked. He patted his chest, and the breastplate underneath the clothes clinked. Parents must have fed you right. Are they still kicking? I might pay them a visit for the family secrets. Masaki frowned. You can come with me, 
or at least, your head can, the Chunin finished. Masaki pumped chakra into his knuckle dusters and darted for the Chunin. They began exchanging blows, with Masaki turning up the aggression every moment, pushing the Chunin, who had a smile plastered on his face the entire time as though unbothered by Masaki. Boy, do you know the problem with Bukijutsu, said the Chunin as he dodged a punch from Masaki. The weapon becomes the focal point of the combat style. A weapon can give you additional firepower, and that's not a bad thing, not at all, but more often than not, a weapon becomes a liability. Skilled shinobi don't allow it to become a problem, but amateurs. The Chunin sidestepped the glowing fist, grabbed his wrist, and dug a palm strike into Masaki's elbow. Let their style skew around the weapon, and once an opponent learns how to bypass it, they can dismantle you at leisure. Masaki felt a sharp pain jolt through his arm. It was enough to stun him for a moment which was all the Chunin needed to launch an all-out assault on Masaki's body. Blow after blow, hard strikes wrecked his body. You are a strong boy, lad, but I'm stronger, the Chunin raised his hand for the final strike. But the strike never came down as he looked up to see a Kimichi dropping down at him, a vicious look on her face and her prized bow staff in her hands. The Chunin jumped back immediately, and Masaki stumbled away just before the bow staff slammed against the ground, spreading cracks out from the point of impact. Good things, he's not alone. The Chunin looked back just in time to see a lightning bolt of lightning release, shock slam into his body and Ninro standing in the distance. The Chunin clenched, and his muscles tensed as the current wrecked its way through him. He groaned as the current disrupted their natural rhythm of contraction and relaxation. But that only lasted a few moments as the deranked jutsu passed out from his body. He took a jittery step towards Nenro and then a normal step, and then he was running. Shing! A Fuma shuriken flew out of the trees and landed before the Chunin, stopping him in his track. And the moment he did, his back fell to heat. He turned back, and a fireball was rolling toward him. Kids! The Chunin sighed before he began to weave hand seals. Arisu watched the fire from fire release, great fireball jutsu hit the Chunin and engulfed the man. Guki was an Uchiha, if the clan could claim one jutsu, it would be this one. The fire burned bright and hot, surrounding the Chunin in its entirety. The Chunin would be lucky to leave behind an unburnt patch of skin. We got him, she whispered with a sigh. For a moment, it got really close. The moment they lost sight of the Chunin, replaced by his clone, they were in grave danger. The real body could have been anywhere, but the Chunin ended that worry by popping behind Takuma, which in itself was a scare if Takuma's friend hadn't rescued him at the last moment. She pulled on the string attached to the ring of her favorite baby and pulled, she didn't want heat and fire to damage the metal. The shuriken didn't budge. She frowned. It must have dug into the ground a bit too deep. She tugged hard, but yet again, the shuriken didn't budge. Arisu squinted her eyes from atop a tree branch. Her shuriken was engulfed in fires, blocking a direct view of it. As the fire flickered, she saw a shadow of something move. It couldn't have been a chunin, he would have been a crisp by now. But then it hit her. Something was missing. There are no screams. The Chunin hadn't screamed a squeak the entire while he was inside the fire. The Chunin wasn't dead. Guys, he isn't dead, she shouted. Then the shadow moved. Out of the fire came what could only be described as a rock monster. The entire figure was covered in hard gray rock in a scaly pattern. With every move, the rocks on the body also moved to accommodate movement. The chest was wide, waist narrow, the forearms below the elbow were shaped like spike clubs of sizes suitable for clubs, and the legs, too, grew wider until they were an elephant's flat stompers near the feet. And the head was shaped as an inverted triangle like a spike crown was placed on the head, leaving only the nose and eyes visible. The monster, the Chunin, rushed out of the flames and smacked Guki with its spike club arms. It took one hit to send the Uchiha crashing through several trees, snapping the several tree trunks in the process. The monster then turned to Ninro and rushed toward him. Akimichi arrived in between them with her bow staff in between them. 
she struck the monster with her staff, but it did nothing. The monster even stopped and let a kimichi rain down strikes on him, but it did nothing. The monster raised his hand, and with one swing, a kimichi was sent flying away. With the path clear, the monster continued after Nenro, who shot a lightning bolt. The lightning bolt crashed on the club-like arms and exploded the rock, leaving a dent, but that was it. The monster continued forward. Nenro jumped away, but the monster caught him, the rocks moved to reveal a hand that gripped Nenro's leg and dragged him back and slammed him to the ground. He raised his other clubbed hand and proceeded to pummel Nenro into the dirt. Let fucking go of my friend. Masaki jumped on the monster with his fist, which was glowing in a blinding light. Masaki's strike created a crater in the monster's back and then got in another strike which made the monster cry. The monster took Masaki off his back and slammed him into the ground before stomping him down with his legs. Masaki shrieked as he got stomped on. The monster suddenly grabbed his head and stumbled away. Arisu, who was sitting on the tree, saw her chance. One look and she could tell it was Yuhi working her jinjutsu and that it wouldn't last long. Arisu jumped down, and even though she wanted to target the Chunin, she remembered the words. If we don't support each other, at least some of us will be dead. If they were going to survive this, they needed to cover each other's back. Clearing Nenro and Masaki was a higher priority than getting a blow on the Chunin. And, well, Takuma told me she was on the support team. Arisu rushed to Masaki's side and put him on the shoulder. She moved towards Nenro, who was a few meters away. But as she was putting the second man over her shoulders, the situation turned once again. Yui's Jinjutsu only longed so long against the Chunin, and he snapped out of it. Arisu immediately threw an explosive tag to get her some time, but the explosion was blocked by the thick arm, and it barely did any damage. She made a note of using a higher grade of explosive tag next time. You're not going anywhere, girly, said the monster. He stomped the ground, and Arisu, who was about to jump away, had her balance disrupted away, and while the two guys on her shoulders weren't a heavy burden for a shinobi like her, they did contribute to her slipping. Three's the charm. She could hear the snark in his voice. Her heart was pounding, she was close to death, she could feel it. The Chunin wasn't something they could face on their own. They had thrown a lot at the man, but he had thrown them around while they had failed to injure him in any significant way. Nenro and Masaki were literally thrashed into the ground, and while they could still fight, the team was weaker than before. So, knowing that, in the moment, she replied with the words which she felt the appropriate. Fuck off, she spat. And unexpectedly, that's what happened. A large quantity of water slammed into the back of the monster, blasting him away. The next moment, Arisu barely caught the figure of Takuma flying by as he planted a kick into the rock-covered Chunin, slamming him to the ground and creating a rather large crater around them. I knew you would need a jutsu to get hard, said Takuma. Chapter 150, Asshole Neem Earth Release, Hardening Jutsu Takuma recognized the jutsu used by the Chunin. The well-known B-rank jutsu would pull the surrounding earth onto the body and harden it to a rocky consistency. The jutsu worked the best when the material used was naturally rigid, but it could use even the most porous of sand into an armor that could handle boatloads of damage. Takuma jumped away from the chunin and landed beside Arisu. Drop them, he said to her. Come on, boys. Not the time to rest. I want my heavy hitters if we're going to survive through this. Arisu dropped Nenro and Masaki on the ground, and the boys groaned as they got up. Masaki punched the ground as he got up and pulled Nenro along with him, who was grabbing his head in agony. Are you both up for it? Takuma asked as he kept an eye on the Chunin, who was now getting up. It'll take more than that to take me down, said Masaki. Nenro nodded. Nenro, lightning is super effective. Use it, said Takuma. Takuma stretched his limbs. Double Suicide Decapitation Jutsu was a simple derank jutsu that trapped the target in the ground, it first softened the ground to pull the target in and then hardened it to trap the target. But in the hands of the Chunin, the jutsu could harden loose soil into dense rock. 
He had to shoot chakra out of his tinketsu all over his body repeatedly to soften the ground enough so he could get out. Most jutsu couldn't be scaled up, but then there were those like his water release, hidden mist jutsu that could create mist as dense as required and, in any volume, as long as enough chakra was pumped into the jutsu. Good, Takuma clapped his hand to gain their attention. We go according to plan. Me and Akimichi will have his attention while you chip away at his armor. That armor uses chakra every second it's up and sucks up more chakra to recover any damage done to it. We either drill through the armor or drain him out of his chakra until he drops it. Pick your poison, damage team. Guki landed beside him with a pissed look on his face, but he didn't look injured. A couple of tree trunks weren't enough to stop an Uchiha. The armor makes him slower, be on your toes, Takuma told Akimichi. He glanced back at the forest, still no sign of either Minoru or Inazuka. He sighed before turning his attention back to the Chunin, who was now facing them. The soil around him rose up, traveling up the legs and distributing to the damaged parts. A few seconds later, the armor was back to full integrity. Takuma turned to Arisu and tossed her something. She looked at her palm to see a bell that was a bit too big to fit on a palm. She looked up at Takuma. Give this to Yuhi, tell her to ring it, tell her to keep ringing it, he said. Fall back and snipe him from a distance. Arisu jumped away, and Takuma weaved hand seals. The water from water release, wild water wave rose up into a blob behind his back that extended into five tentacle-like appendages. Water release, eight tentacles was a D-ranked jutsu, but Takuma believed it to be misranked. It was definitely a C-ranked jutsu. Jutsu rank classification wasn't an exact science. There were many factors involved in classifying a jutsu, the learning difficulty, chakra requirements, damage, and intended effect in the case of non-combat jutsu, among other factors. D-ranked jutsu were usually easier to learn than C-ranked jutsu, but eight tentacles was hard to learn, harder than any C-rank jutsu Takuma knew, and he had yet to learn it completely. But for the effect it provided, the jutsu was too tough, but it was easy to learn at the same time. The skill floor was low while the skill ceiling was too high. As the name suggested, the jutsu allowed the creation of eight tentacles that could be freely controlled, creating those eight tentacles was easy enough, and the difficulty matched other D-rank jutsu. The real difficulty came in controlling the tentacles. Every tentacle was an additional limb that needed to be controlled consciously. The brain wasn't designed to suddenly have one more limb integrated, much less eight. Takuma had to gradually train his brain to control the additional limbs. It was an arduous process. When Takuma had sparred against Momo, he could manage two tentacles while moving and four while standing still. It had taken eight months of training between his narcotics task force to get his usage up to five tentacles when he was moving and six when he was standing still. The higher the number, the higher the difficulty. Ding! Takuma tossed three kunai into the air that were snatched up by the tentacles. He left his hands and two tentacles empty for other usages. Come on, big guy. Let's dance, you and me. Takuma charged for the chunin. The Chunin laughed and started running towards Takuma with heavy steps that shook the surroundings. The armor made him slow, but he was still agile, just not for someone his level. Takuma took to the air with a spinning kick, chakra pumping through his leg. The Chunin punched out the impact shredded through the rock armor. Chunks of rock flew everywhere, but the moment they separated from the armor, they turned into soil. The two free tentacles snaked around the arm and propped him up, giving Takuma an additional moment of airtime. He used the leverage to twist midair and landed another kick straight in the Chunin's face. But the Chunin was faster and blocked it with his other arm. More soil exploded. Ding! That's it, boy. I can piss this much off, said the Chunin. Nope, said Takuma. There's a reason evolution gave us hands with fingers, and you exchanged them with clubs. The three tentacles with Kanai jammed the blades into the small gaps between the rocks before Takuma jumped away. The Chunin looked down to see three explosive tags dangling from the tail of the Kanai. Boom! The three grade two explosion tags tore through the armor, 
leaving huge gaping hull-shaped vulnerabilities in the armor. Before Takuma even landed on his feet, he saw the holes already mending. He clicked his tongue, the recovery was too fast. But he wasn't alone. The damage team picked up the hammer. Ding! Nenro had his arm outstretched as a dangerous amount of lightning arc circles around his arm. Lightning release, lightning bolt jutsu looked a lot like lightning release, shock because the former was a C-rank jutsu, and the latter was a weaker D-rank derivative. It made sense why Nenro would choose lightning bolt as one of his C-rank choices. Learning a derivative jutsu made learning the higher rank jutsu easier. If Takuma's lightning affinity had been any good, he would have followed the same path as Nenro. A shrill whistle followed a powerful lightning bolt that slammed into the chunin. There was a huge canyon between C-rank and B-rank jutsu. The jutsu ranking system had a certain quality. The rank scaling wasn't linear. There was a jump from D-rank to C-rank, a sharper leap from C-rank to B-rank, and a rocket climb from B-rank to A-rank. But there were cases when the jutsu rank gaps could be bridged. And those cases were known as affinity matchups. Lightning Bolt might be a C-rank just, but because lightning trumped earth, it could do significant damage to hardening jutsu. The Chunin must have known that because he tried to dodge, but the heavy weight slowed him down. The lightning bolt ripped rock on the left side of his body. There was still a thick layer remaining because affinity advantage could only do much when the two jutsu were of different ranks, and the Chunin was clearly more skilled in his jutsu than Ninro was with his. But it was enough for the next part. Ding! Masaki dropped in front of the Chunin with his shining fists and laid down a brutal combo that made Takuma wonder for a second if he should extend the invitation to the ring. It was getting quite boring underground, be it ninjutsu category or the 2v1 fights, and Sabura refused 2v1 ninjutsu category fights to him because if he won one of those, none of the ninjutsu category fighters would even consider a fight with him. Well, at least the money was good. Masaaki's knuckle dusters tore through the armor like jackhammers against a paved road. Masaaki's bukijutsu was comparable to Takuma's augmented strikes, but unlike Takuma, Masaaki could do damage from a distance through concentrated shockwaves, the simple knucklehead simply preferred to punch it out close distance. The Chunin backhanded Masaaki away but was blocked by Akimichi, who caught the arm. She looked like it was straining her to the limit to hold her down. Takuma narrowed his eyes, recognizing the signs of augmentation, it was similar to what Akimichi Hideaki used, but she was not as skillful as him. Akimichi pulled on the Chunin to gain his attention, so he didn't notice in time when Guki spat out globs of silver-tinged mucus all over the Chunin's body. Akimichi jumped away and the next moment, a kunai whistled down from the trees with an explosive tag that lit the mucus on fire. The mucus was highly flammable as it took mere seconds before the entire Chunin was on heat fire. Fire Release, Incendiary Jutsu A nasty C-rank jutsu which was napalm. It burned hot, adhered to the target, and the flames were super hard to extinguish. Takuma clicked his tongue. Fall back, he said. Ding! The damage team hesitated for a moment, but they jumped back as Takuma stepped forth. He's not done yet? Akimichi asked, standing by his side. Before Takuma could reply, a yell came from within the flames. Kitty gloves are off you little vermins. I'm going to kill you all. Takuma re-equipped three of his tentacles with kunai and sighed. It's a chunin with B-rank jutsu in his arsenal, he wouldn't have survived being a rogue if he went down so easily. Ding! Akimichi Mika gripped her bow staff till her knuckles were white as she saw the madness going on in front of her. Just a couple of minutes ago, they had the upper hand. The Chunin was burning in high flames with armor riddled with chunks, they just needed a few more blows to take a Chunin. And according to Takuma, it was not just any Chunin. It was a Chunin who had the ability to efficiently access the considerable amount of chakra reserves through Burank Jutsu. But it seemed that it was a wrong decision to strip the Chunin's armor because the armor seemed to be a defensive strategy. When it fell away, the Chunin switched to an offensive strategy. She looked to her right at a crater where Masaki was stomped a moment ago. On her left, she saw Nenro hanging from a branch after he was punched out by earthen projectiles that weren't even aimed at him, 
the Chunin had unleashed an offensive Birank Jutsu at Takuma, and Nenro was caught in the crossfire. Nenro, still hanging on the branch, twitched. Off balance, he fell off the branch but grabbed onto it at the last second, but the grip failed almost immediately, and he fell to the ground. Nenro groaned as he clutched his stomach. H. He's in bad shape, said Nenro. It was Yamanaka controlling Nenro's body. He had done the same with Masaki. He hadn't been helpful in combat, but he had been able to take over control when someone was in trouble and move them away. It was annoying when Yamanaka took control of her body midair, to be fair, she blacked out, unconscious, it was mighty helpful that he kicked her back up when she was back on two feet. Try to get him back, we need people. Also, try to find what the fuck is taking Inazuka so long, she yelled before facing the front. The Chunin was a formidable opponent, and with the Uchiha the only member of the damaged team still active and Fuma aiding him, they needed more firepower. She was going to switch to attack, leaving Takuma as the person to keep the Chunin in check. It was a dangerous choice, for Takuma, but it was a choice she was making, because, as far as she had seen, he seemed to be doing fine entertaining the Chunin on his own. Chapter 151 Sad Times Come on, sheep. Is that all you got? asked the Chunin. He enjoyed the look on the kids' faces. The slow growth of displeasure, pain, anxiety, and exhaustion crept up on the brat's face as they continued to fight. It was only a matter of time before the little chicks got tired, and as they did that, he would drop them one by one until the fucking brat in front of him was the only one remaining. He glanced at the small gap in the canopy. He could see smoke. There were more people than the brats. He, of course, knew that there was a Chunin running the farm, and there was no way these little chumps could have taken him out and still be in the condition to take him on. There was a good chance that there was a Chunin leading the brats, and if their numbers were to say anything, and taking the Hidden Leaf standard team structure, it wasn't crazy to assume there were multiple Chunin. He was guessing too. The Chunin running the farm was good, but the narcissistic fucker wasn't good enough to take on three peers at the same time. At the end of it all, there were one or two Chunin waiting for him on the other side of the brats. He wasn't proud, but he had suffered some injuries, nothing serious, but against a litter of Jinin, he shouldn't have suffered anything. All of it was because of the brat in front of him. The leader of the bunch. The lean brat looked like he hadn't trained a single day in his life, but there was a nasty bite behind his strikes. Chakra augmentation, both him and the Akimichi chick. Then there was the pyromaniac Uchiha, the pesky little Yamanaka who was controlling people when they went down, the Fuma girl with her shuriken, kunai, and explosive tags, and there was even the Inazuka fighting one of his genin, there was an entire galore of clan kids here. Which raised the question of who was the leader brat. He had been out of the village for five years, but he couldn't pinpoint the background of the combat style. The brat wasn't from a clan, his fighting style reeked of the ring, and he was experienced, excellent body control, a surprising amount of skill and two chakra affinities, a rarity for the age. The boy was the strongest, but that didn't explain why the clan kids followed him. To pull prideful clan kids into a line was something else. Well, whatever, he thought. He needed to finish this. He didn't know if there was a Chunin or two waiting for him after he was done with the kids, so he preferred not to use more chakra than he had already. He had no problem running away, but he had built a good comfortable life for himself after leaving the village, it would be a huge pain if he had to start over. He figured he could use some chakra before going to see if the narcissistic fucker needed some help or if he had done the world some good and had left two heavily injured hidden leaf Chunin for easy cleanup. Playtime's over, kiddo. Takuma caught a punch in the face, but he lashed out with an uppercut for the jaw. Unfortunately, the Chunin caught that punch and threw him away, but Takuma's tentacles latched onto the Chunin's arm to stay close. Takuma tugged on the Chunin, but the man suddenly sped up and dug a palm strike into Takuma's gut. He felt a sheer physical force hit him. Instinctively, all five tentacles tried to latch onto the Chunin, but he was sent back with such force that the water couldn't stay together, and the tentacles were ripped apart, and the water tentacles were quite resilient because of the chakra flowing in the water. Takuma flew back meters, 
and he had to concentrate hard to maintain his focus and balance midair. The water redistributed between the tentacles, and they jammed into the ground to slow him down. He dug his feet to slow himself further down but still ended up slamming against a tree trunk with rib-shaking force. He shook his head to get rid of the dizziness and looked up just in time to see the Chunin weaving hand seals before long thin earthen spears emerged out of the ground and shot toward his team. Gookie was hit by two spears hit straight, and he was all but skewered. Arisu was wielding her Fuma shuriken in close combat mode and ripped two spears to threads, but a third one stabbed through her thigh. Akimichi had an impressive performance with her bow staff and avoided all the spears aimed at her, only for the Chunin to take her out after a couple of seconds of taijutsu back and forth. Now, it's me, just the two of us, brat, the Chunin looked towards Takuma as he held Akimichi by the throat. He threw her away as he made his way to him. Takuma got up and cracked his neck. He was sure he had broken at least a couple ribs, his left leg felt off, a fracture for sure, his right shoulder felt sluggish and painful, he had screwed up his rotator cuff, there were three more things he could feel, and then a few more that would show up when the adrenaline would exit his bloodstream. All of his combatant teammates were out. Yuhi and Yamanaka were within the trees. Stay, he yelled. He didn't want the two of them to come out. You should tell them to run. I'll get them after I'm done with you. At least, this way, there'll be a fun hunt, said the Chunin. The raids were always in teams, so Takuma never got the chance to use it in the field. The ring didn't allow it because of the stupid rules. And he had gotten bored of dodging logs and rubber pellets. Oh, there will be a hunt, all right, said Takuma as he began weeding hand seals. The Chunin stopped in his tracks and looked at his surroundings as a dense mist descended onto the area. The mist became wider by the second, and visibility plummeted until no one could see further than they could reach with their hands. Takuma breathed in deeply and felt the mist fill his lungs. He himself couldn't see that well in the situation, but he had been training his ears and nose for years. He had given more effort to this jutsu than any other thing, and he barely saw any use. That was going to change today. Let the hunt begin. He looked at the mist surrounding him. Water release, hidden mist jutsu. The kid seriously had some skill with water affinity. He could barely see anything, but that meant neither could the kid. They were in the same situation. I can see you clearly, you know. He whipped a kunai in the direction of the brat's voice. That was not even close. The next moment, he was assaulted by an augmented kick into his knee. The Chunin tried to grab the brat, but his instinct forced his body to catch the kunai that suddenly appeared before his face. Be careful, or you'll lose an eye, but that won't make any difference here. The brat's voice echoed. He was using some sort of voice modulation using chakra. Party tricks, he thought, but he couldn't help but his caution growing. He had no way to blow away the mist, but that didn't mean he was trapped. He simply needed to run out of the area covered by the mist. He followed his internal compass and ran north. But the moment he took his second step, he felt cold metal slice through his calf. It was a deep cut, and he almost lost balance. Don't try to ruin the game. You don't want a penalty, do you? The Chunin, now hobbled, slowly moved. It was better to stay on the move rather than stay at a location the brat knew. Getting out of the mist was still his only option other than using more chakra to blow everything up around him. But he needed to reserve some chakra. Eh, this is a rigged game. I'll give you the penalty. Alarm bells rang in the Chunin's brain, and he got ready for an attack. It didn't come. He waited for a second, two, five, ten, but nothing. But just as he released some tension and got back on the move, he got assaulted by a fist in the face, a kunai in the side, and a blow to the kneecap. He bit his lip and waited for the moment the kid came close in for another attack, and the moment the brat became visible, he went for the grab. He got a kunai in his shoulder, but he got the hand in his grasp. Fuck you, kid. He landed a solid punch into the kid's face and was about to break the arm when water was suddenly forced into his mouth. The moment of shock made him lose his grip, and the brat picked up a chance to run away, 
but not before slamming a knee into the face. He had forgotten about the damn tentacle. Fuck this, thought the Chunin. I need to wall down. It was clear that the kid wasn't going to play mind games with him anymore. He was going for the silent kill the next time he hit. Screw saving Chakra. He was going to get rid of the Jinin and escape. Fuck this joint and job, there was no shortage of work, and he guessed he could get to a comfortable spot in a couple more months. He began weaving hand seals for a B-rank defensive jutsu that would cover him in a dome. But as he weaved hand seals, he heard a sound. Ding! Hmm? What was that noise? He had heard that before. In fact, he had heard it a lot during the fight. Since when had it been going on? And that's when it happened. Ding! He froze up. He couldn't move a single muscle, and the sound of a bell filled his head, repeatedly filling his ear. The mist suddenly lifted, and he moved his eyes to find himself surrounded by a field full of the brat. The broken nose on the boy did make him happy, but it didn't change the fact that he couldn't move. What had the brat done? He saw a kunai slip into the brat's hand, every brat's hand, and he started to struggle harder, but no matter what he did, he couldn't move. It was as though he was set in stone, a statue. Shing! As his attention was on the brat, a short sword was shoved into his back and came out of the front. He looked down at the dripping tail. He could instantly tell the blade had gone clean through his heart. He was dead. He looked back and found himself staring into the red eyes of an Uchiha. What a beautiful sight! It seemed he had helped an Uchiha activate his Sharingan. That didn't make the situation feel any better. He wondered if he could screw up the Uchiha brat, traumatize him somehow. You were a tough fight. He turned back to see the brat had hobbled close. Jinjutsu, he asked. The brat jammed a kunai into his throat, and only then did he nod. It usually only takes half a dozen or eight rings to work, but I had to be careful with you so I had it keep ringing. And well, there was no way in hell you were going to break free after several dozen bell rings. Bibo Hhoo, said the Chunin as he spurted blood. He didn't want numbers to be the last thing he wanted to hear. A hundred little things passed through his mind. An entire lifetime of memories. There were happy ones, but he couldn't pick out happy ones from recent memories, all of them were so far in the past. Ah, this is not how I imagined it. And with that, he drew his final breath. Chapter 152 Progression As the mist faded, the first thing Yuhi searched for was the Chunin. Among the cardinal rules of combat was never letting the enemy out of sight. She held the bell tight and rang it again while her eyes scoured the ground, darting among the trees. Her sight finally landed on the Chunin, who now had a short sword stabbed through the back and a kunai dug into the throat. Takuma pulled the kunai out. The blood spurted as the Chunin's body fell to the side. Takuma and Uchiha, still alert, stared down at the Chunin for a few more moments before Takuma pressed his foot into the Chunin's throat for a few seconds before pulling back. It was gruesome, disrespectful, and made her stomach squirm. Her hold on the bell lightened, she no longer needed to ring it. As she dropped down from the tree, Takuma disappeared using the body flicker jutsu. She jogged to Uchiha, her eyes sticking to the dead body. Where did he go? she asked. He went to check up on Inazuka and the Minoru. Yuhi noticed that the Uchiha was breathing heavily. The sheen of sweat had almost cleared the blood and dirt on his face. Then she saw his eyes. The tired but deep red eyes of the Uchiha clan stared at her. Why you, you're Sharingan. She knew that he didn't possess it already. Huh, W what? Uchiha's hand went to his face. It seemed he hadn't noticed. Yuhi pulled a pocket mirror from her weapon's pouch and held it before his face. The Uchiha looked stunned as he stared into the mirror with his eyes widened. His mouth opened and closed a couple of times before he got the words out. I did it! I did it! Thank God, I did it! He looked relieved as though a burden had been lifted off his shoulder. He laughed a weak chuckle as he stared at the sky. When he looked back down, 
the eyes had reverted to their original onyx color, and he looked exhausted like he could fall down the next moment. Are you all right? she asked. He nodded. Yeah, just tired. He then sat down on the ground and stared at the dead Chunin. We did it, he said. We killed the bastard, and survived. We did, she said. She noticed the short sword in the Chunin's back belonged to Uchiha. He had been on the ground, risked his life, and from the looks, had landed the killing blow to the Chunin. While she had hidden in the trees, ringing a damn bell again and again without knowing if it was working. When Fuma gave her the bell and told Takuma would know what to do with it, she was confused. But it immediately struck her. A bell. A bell for the Jinjutsu, bell sound clone. Takuma wanted her to ring the bell for her. She was deeply skeptical about Takuma's plan working. Bell sound clone was an auditory Jinjutsu and used the sound from the bell as the carrier of the chakra. She didn't think the plan would work because the bell was so far away from Takuma and he had no control over the bell. For the Jinjutsu to work, the user had to load the sound waves with the chakra, and for the user to do that, they needed to know when the sound was produced. Takuma had outsourced that job, trusting her to do it for her, he was lucky that she knew to ring the bell at equal intervals so that Takuma could count mentally to know when the next ring was coming. Most importantly, lacing the sound with the sound was easier when the source was close. With her ringing the bell and Takuma moving constantly in battle, the simple task of imbibing sound waves with chakra shot up in difficulty. Did Takuma put the chunin in a jinjutsu? she asked. The fog from the hidden mist jutsu obstructed her view of anything that was happening inside, so she didn't know if the plan was successful. I don't know, he said. It was very hazy, but I saw the chunin standing still, so I took the chance. Wait, I remember now, the chunin asked Takuma if it was a jinjutsu. Takuma nodded after he stabbed him in the throat. Yuhi's eyes widened. It worked. Takuma pulled it off. He had managed to pull off the Jinjutsu while being in a disadvantageous position, not only was he gathering the Chunin's focus on his own, the difficulty of casting the Jinjutsu had gone up due to the situation. But even in those circumstances, Takuma had managed to pull it off. And she was supposed to be the Jinjutsu specialist in the group, Yuhi thought bitterly. Arisu dragged her feet towards Yuhi and Uchiha. Her arm was killing her, she was hit directly by an earth bullet in her shoulder, and it had all but disabled it for the moment. She could tell it would take medical help and some physical therapy on top of it to get full functionality back. Yuhi, check him for injuries, said Arisu. She placed a small scroll on the floor and weaved a release seal. A puff of smoke later, a full-sized field emergency medical kit sat over the open scroll. Yuhi had Uchiha lay down and begin treating the damaged team member. As Arisu turned to walk away, Yuhi called out. What about you? I'm fine. Go look at Akimichi as well. I'm going to see how the others are doing. She located Yamanaka looking after Nenro and Masaki. Both were lying unconscious on the ground. On the other hand, Yamanaka was sitting beside them, holding his head with a pained look on his face. Are you injured? she asked. No, no, I... I'm fine, Yamanaka replied with a groan. I overdrew my hand. Taking over five of you was a strain. None of you were actually cooperative with me. Yamanaka had taken control over the bodies of Arisu, Nenro, Masaki, Akimchi, and Uchiha at least once during the fight, getting them out of the danger's way or alerting them of risky situations. Arisu didn't like someone else taking control over her body and instinctually resisted, but she recognized Yamanaka's contribution, he had probably, at the very least, prevented serious injuries, deaths even. She shivered at the thought that there were Yamanaka who could take over minds and bodies without the person ever realizing they were possessed. Especially him, Yamanaka pointed at Nenro. He really didn't like me in his body. It's an uncomfortable feeling, said Arisu, but thank you for everything. Yamanaka waved her off. Everyone had a role. I just played mine. And I'm okay not being in front, facing that monster, he said. Arisu nodded. 
She might not have been completely detached from the fight like Yamanaka, but she was more than comfortable snipping at the Chunin with her baby and explosive tags from a distance. She had gone close when Nenro and Masaki had gone down and understood what risk everyone was facing. Can you carry them? Yuhi's doing emergency treatment. I can take one of them. One of her shoulders was still good. No, I'll take them both, he said, glancing at her bloody shoulder. They returned to where Yuhi was treating Uchiha and Akimichi. Takuma hadn't returned yet. Her eyes went to the Chunin. Blood leaking from the neck had pooled around the head and shoulder. She shivered when the intrusive thought of the Chunin getting up and killing them all before they could react flashed past her mind. He's dead. I checked his pulse, Uchiha said. Arisu gave him a nod. Arisu had been working with Takuma since he exited training and entered active duty. They had gotten closer when she joined him in the narcotics task force, working under him as his second-in-command made her privy to much of Takuma's day. She knew that he woke up early in the morning to train every day, and he showered at home, but for the past few months, he had been showering at the office because he had been training more in the morning because he had to cut short his after-work short as he had started working late. She even trained with him in the morning a day or two every month, and Takuma trained early, and he trained hard, called it a habit instilled into him. But not once in the spars or raids had Takuma ever shown that he could use the hidden mist jutsu. So when the heavy fog covered the field, her vigilance had shot up, thinking it was the Chunin either trying to escape or, worse, wiping them out while they couldn't see. But as it turned out, it was Takuma. She was well aware of how dangerous Takuma was in the field. They had been on plenty of raids and arrests for her to know how Takuma operated. Setting leadership aside, Takuma was aggressive as a combatant. He gave one chance for surrender before ensuring none had any attention to resist by using force that bordered on excessive. A point that they had discussed and fought over multiple times. Keeping him in check had become part of her job. A job she had done well, they had complaints, but she had made sure nothing stuck. The Narcotics Task Force was a new initiative, one led by a Jinin, they had to be careful how they operated. Takuma was a good leader, a better manager, but no one could be perfect. Thankfully, Takuma wasn't a one-man department, and everyone covered each other's backs. Looks like everyone's gathered. Everyone looked to see Takuma emerge from behind a tree. He was supporting Minoru, who was limping, his foot bleeding from a nasty cut. Beside them, Inazuka and his Ninkan were dragging three people behind them. Are they dead? asked Arisu. Two of them, said Inazuka as he sat down on the ground. His Ninkin settled in his lap. Arisu walked to Minoru. Are you all right? she asked. I think I'm going to stick to being a sensory Nin, Minoru said with a pained look. Arisu chuckled. You need to improve your combat abilities, Takuma interjected with a frown. You can train with me once a week in the morning if you want. Give me a year, and I'll make sure you won't die in the field. Arisa chuckled as she shook her head. Takuma had been trying to train Minoru for months now, but the latter refused to accept Takuma's offer because Minoru knew he would be trapped if he accepted. Arisu, lie down. You're bleeding, Takuma said as he laid Minoru down. So are you, she said but followed the instructions. Takuma poked her in the shoulder, and she yelped in pain. What the fuck? she hissed at him. I can still move my arms, Takuma chuckled. You did a good job out there. We wouldn't have been able to do it without you. I know, you should thank me more, she said. Takuma smiled as he disinfected her wound. Arisu stared at Takuma. After a moment of silence, she said. Thank you. Achiha Guki stared down at the ground. He didn't have the energy to lift his head or even raise his eyes. All he wanted was to sleep for a week and not do anything, which would be an appropriate way to spend time after a B-rank mission, but he knew he wouldn't get to do that because the moment he revealed that he had activated his Sharingan, he wouldn't be left alone for a week. There would be relatives coming home to congratulate him, the ceremony that happened after an Uchiha activated their Sharingan, all the preparation involved in that. He would be swamped for at least a week. Just thinking about it made him tired. 
He contemplated holding back the news for a week before revealing it to his parents. Congratulations are in order. Guki glanced at Arisu, lying on the ground, getting treated by Takuma. He smiled. I didn't even know I had activated it. You he had to tell me. The mist was so thick that I could barely see anything anyway. Guki glanced at Takuma. The hidden mist jutsu was a known way to obstruct the Sharingan, but one required extraordinary skill in the jutsu to obstruct the Sharingan with great effectiveness. Maybe it was because he had just activated it that Takuma was able to blind him even with the Sharingan activated, or Takuma was just that good with the mist. He couldn't say for sure. Will you be staying with us? Takuma suddenly asked. Guki furrowed his brow. What do you mean? Yes, what do you mean, said Arisu. Well, with the Sharingan, your status in the clan has changed. Doors which were closed before are now open. You probably can get any opportunity you want right now. Which raises the question, will you stay with us or move on? Takuma said as he continued to treat Arisu. Of course, he'll be staying, said Arisu. It's not a sure thing, said Takuma. His situation has changed. He has new options in front of him now. He should take time to think them through and make the best decision for himself. You don't want me on the task force? asked Guki. It sounded like Takuma was trying to kick him out. Takuma laughed. Are you kidding me? And Uchiha with Sharingan, of course, I would want you on the team. He looked up at Guki. But that might not be the best course of option for you. I care for everyone on the team and want to see the best for everyone. As the person in charge of the task force, I would hate to lose you, but as a teammate, I would have you doing what you deserve. Takuma pointed at Guki's eyes with two fingers. Those upgraded eyes of yours change the situation. Think about it, Guki. Guki stared at Takuma, who moved on to treating Minoru. He had been part of the narcotics task force from the very first raid on the Maiko Triad before Takuma had even floated the proposal. He had been there every step of the way, seen their ups and downs and participated in their victories and losses. He had worked hard to make the narcotics task force what it was today. He didn't want to move, but as Takuma said, he now had more options and, indeed, had a choice ahead of him. And just like him, Takuma too had a choice in front of him with the situation brewing back at home with the change of leadership, which was all but sure to happen, looming on the horizon. Chapter 153, Danzo Schemes Takuma gazed at everyone on the team, the nine people who had helped him bring down the Chunin. He didn't know half of them well. Nenro and Masaki were his best friends, while Arisu was his second-in-command, partner, and firmest supporter inside the police force. Minoru and Guki were his co-workers, and he was their boss, which put a level of separation between them. Yamanaka, Yuhi, Akimichi, and Inazuka, he had met them for the first time for this mission. Despite that, he was glad none of them had died. It was a miracle. Even though he had planned and given appropriate roles to the people based on their capabilities to increase their chances of survival, he was operating under the assumption of the worst-case scenario. I, I would like to thank everyone here, Takuma addressed the group. Their eyes shifted towards him. Today has been a tough day for all. The mission, even before this, was a stressful one because of the stakes involved, and I don't need to mention the unexpected we just went through. He looked everyone in the eyes. We had some arguments here and there, which is to be expected, except for my team, I haven't worked with any of you. That went for Ninro and Masaki as well, they were his friends, but he hadn't worked with them for two months of basic training, and that was two years ago. But I have no complaints regarding this group. I'm thankful for how everyone conducted themselves today and their contribution toward the mission. I'll be writing stellar reviews for all of you in the mission reports. Due to budgetary reasons, I can't give you guys bonuses, but Arisu will be laying out a party when we return home. Everyone chuckled. Takuma glanced at the Uchiha. And I'm sure Guki will contribute to the celebrations. Count me in, Guki smiled. Takuma smiled before continuing. He first looked at Yamanaka. It's because of you that we all made it out alive. 
With you controlling our bodies, the vulnerability of every individual was cut short by several levels. If you hadn't done that, looked after us, strained yourself, we wouldn't be sitting here together, whole and alive. And for that, I'm eternally grateful. Thank you. Yamanaka soaked up the praise and attention. Akimichi, Takuma turned to the girl, it was a pleasure sharing responsibility for you. Without you, we would have gone down when the Chunin had that rock armor on him before he even turned on the offensive. You're one tough Kunoichi. Thank you for keeping us all safe. You'll be the Akimichi I would be looking for when I need the toughest shinobi. He didn't mind her switching to attack, leaving him alone to fend against the Chunin. It was the right decision, and he commended her for it. I'm one call away, reach me any time, Akimichi weakly raised her bow staff. Having been on the tank team, she had taken a nasty beating. It was a testament to the Akimichi toughness that she was even conscious now. Yui, Takuma moved. She was sitting close to him, so he reached out and grasped her hand. You're the reason we were able to take out the Chunin. It had to be the bell clone Jutsu, but he was too much for me to handle. I couldn't cast the Jinjutsu while contesting his attacks. Without the Jinjutsu, without you, I don't know how to take him down. The fight would probably still be going on, and as you can see, our Chunin are still not here. Please, you he looked embarrassed, anyone could have rang that bell. I disagree, said Takuma. In the heat of the moment, when the stress was at its maximum, I could only relay a simple instruction to Arisu. At that moment, you were the only one I trusted to understand what I was trying to do because of your knowledge. Even if I asked someone else, they wouldn't have understood what I was trying to do, and even if they recognized the jutsu, there was a chance they would have abandoned the plan when they thought the situation down here become tough, but you had the patience because of your understanding to stick to the plan and follow the instruction. Don't cut yourself short. You played a crucial role in taking down the Chunin. You earned the credit you deserved. Takuma was just relieved that he had Yuhi nearby. The hidden Miss Jutsu would have only stopped the Chunin for a while before he would have been able to get out. Even if he was able to force him to flee due to injuries, if Takuma was able to get a read on the Chunin in the short time he knew the man, the Chunin would have tried to pull something in an act of final revenge. The Jinjutsu was the only way to get the Chunin to stay and end the ordeal. Plus, if the Chunin escaped, he would spread the information regarding the busted farm to the drug network, which would be problematic for the overarching case the Narcotics Task Force was working on. It was an overall positive outcome. Inazuka and Minoru, and he went to sleep, Takuma looked at Minoru, who was sleeping on the ground. He turned to Inazuka. I'm sorry to send you out on your own. I'm a follower of the operational practice that a shinobi should have at least one partner with them during combat or any field function. He was taught that in the field tactics courses he took. And sending you out to deal with those jinin alone was a risky decision. But the jinin were extra bodies that we couldn't have interfering. Especially you, Inazuka, you had to deal with two guys alone. I wasn't alone. I had a partner with me all along, Inazuka pointed at his ninkin, who wagged his tail under the petting. That's true, Takuma smiled. Guki, our star. The one to strike down the big bad, Takuma turned to the Uchiha. I have told you this before, I will say it again. You have a lot of firepower, and you use it well. It's a little bit difficult to use it in the village with all the people and buildings around, but here, away from civilization, you can really see how much damage you can do. He looked around, and some flames and embers were still burning around them. If the forest had been any drier, they would have a forest fire. And now you have gained another powerful weapon, not bad for a day's work, train it, and train it well, you'll be a force to reckon with in no time. And don't forget us, little people, when you're a big deal. Takuma and Guki laughed along with the rest of the group. Minoru woke up. Huh, what happened? Nothing, go sleep, said Takuma. You did good out there today. Go rest. Umanim, Minoru mumbled before closing his eyes. The poor guy was too tired after their ordeal. 
Takuma would have preferred if their sensory Nin was awake to keep in on their surroundings for more unexpected surprises, but he couldn't force him to work in his condition. Arisu, my favorite Fuma, said Takuma. Oh, it's my turn now, is it? Go ahead, said Arisu, catching up to what Takuma was doing. Despite the large amount of time we spend with each other, I don't think I say it enough. You're an excellent Kunoichi, officer, and person, I rely on you more than I have relied on anyone else, Takuma doled out praise without holding back. Everyone goes to you first for advice before they even look at me because they know you're the most reliable person in the office. You have the makings of a good leader. Arisu frowned at him. Her eyes asked, What are you doing? Takuma shrugged. Both of them knew he wasn't going to be in his current position for too long. Arisu might not succeed him immediately, but she was the best option when she met the other prerequisite. His time was almost over. Even the success of the B-rank mission wouldn't be enough. The day Fugaku had added scars to Takuma's police force personnel file, that day he had started the timer on Takuma's progress in the police force. Everything would be used against him to take the fruit of his labor away from him, and they had the smoking done right under their noses. Takuma flashed Arisu a smile. He moved on to the next one. Masaki, you need to work on your defense. Your situational awareness can sometimes be shoddy, which gets you in trouble. It takes one bad injury for things to hit rock bottom. Aggression is good, I support it, Arisu scoffed, Takuma ignored her, but there should be a method to the madness. The old Masaki would pound the enemy into the ground and not get touched once. Other than that, you're golden. The time with the Kimichi has done you good. Keep it up. You're my golden boy. Masaki shot a thumbs up and groaned. Takuma turned to Nenro. If I learned anything today, I don't want to fight you. That lightning release jutsu had some serious juice behind them. I envy you, my friend. You got the smarts and the skills. I know you're already planning for it, but let me give you a vote of confidence. You're ready for the next tune and exams. I believe when everyone sees you on that stage, they'll know your true value. Go for it. Nenro looked surprised, which was rare because he always seemed to be in control. Takuma smiled, enjoying the expression. I. Thank you, Nenro replied. You want to join me in the exams? I will think about it, Takuma smiled but he knew that wasn't possible. Ninro was simply being swayed by the moment. Chunin exams seemed to be the best plan of action for him. A promotion could give him leverage, which he could either use in the police force or use it to transfer somewhere else. Switching jobs every couple years was a legit tactic for salary hikes and moving up the corporate ladder, Takuma wondered if it would work in the shinobi world. With the praise session done, Takuma sat down and relaxed, but just as they were coming down from the battle's high, the two hidden leaf chunin returned. Looks like you had an adventure of your own, said one of them, looking at the carnage around them. What took you so long? asked Takuma. He kept the anger deep down. Taking on a chunin wasn't part of their responsibility. Takuma had bought chunin on the mission for a reason. The bastard tried to make a run for it. We had to chase him down. He knew the terrain better than us, took some time to kill him, answered the second chunin. Takuma sighed. He wanted to argue, but with everything over, he was too tired to have a dispute. He let it go. You recognize him? Takuma pointed to the chunin they had killed. The two chunin took out their bingo books and flipped through the profiles until they arrived at the right one. Oh my, you guys scored decently. He has a bounty on his head. The pay is better if you had gotten him alive, but dead pay isn't bad. Takuma turned to the genin. Well guys, I think we have our party fund. Later that day, in an unknown location. There was a knock on the door. The room was a simple office with absolutely zero personalization, no personality reflecting the user's taste. There was only one decoration which hung from the wall behind the desk in the room. Come in. The subordinate entered the room and greeted the person inside the room. I have a report, sir, said the subordinate plainly with no emotion. 
Speak. One of our farms was just raided. The one in charge sent us a coded message. From the looks of it, the message was written hastily. It's safe to assume that he is either dead or has deserted. What was the message? Requesting backup. The farm was found by Hidden Lee Shinobi. The man in the office stayed silent for a moment. Was the man in charge part of the foundation? He asked. No, sir. He was an outside contractor. The message said Hidden Lee Shinobi, not the ANBU. Hidden Lee Shinobi, sir. Then there must be a trail. Find who was involved in the raid. Yes, sir. You may leave now. The subordinate left and the man in the office returned to his work as though nothing had happened. Behind him was a square wall hanging with a motif of a golden tree with deep roots sewn into it. Chapter 154, Danzo's Scheme Part 2 From the day they left the village to the day they returned. The mission took a whopping ten days to wrap up. They had to process the entire farm, search the whole place for information, take samples of the crop and equipment, and then torch the remaining crop down to shut the site down permanently. Moreover, they had to stay on the farm for a couple of days to recover from their injuries, and their return journey was made slower as they had prisoners along with them. The Hidden Frost incident had been the last time since Takuma had been out of the village for such a long time. The most time outside the village he did was on his regular hunts and overnight stays in the wilderness. But those only went for two days at tops ever since he had taken up his position in the narcotics task force. He wanted to go on hunts more often, but he didn't have the time these days. And because the mission had taken so long, Takuma could only take a two-day break before he was back in the police force headquarters for work. An unexpected element during a B-rank mission that your plan didn't account for. You and the other Jinin were lucky that you survived the ordeal, said Jonin Uchiha Sayuri, the head of organized crime. As the saying goes, ma'am, no plan survives first contact with the enemy, Takuma replied. They sat in her office while Takuma gave the big boss a debrief of the mission. I have not heard of that saying, Jin and Takuma, but those are some wise words, said Sayuri, impressed. I shall remember them. Takuma smiled and nodded. He disagreed with the luck part, luck was only half of the equation, the rest of it was pure life-risking effort. It made sense that not every saying from his world made it to this world, but he thought a war saying by a military man would have made it to the world of mercenary shinobi. What's next? she asked. I have contacted Tokabetsu Jonin Oishi for the interrogation. Taro's mother had very recently gotten a promotion. We will get some hard actionable intel out from the farm help and the Jinin part of the delivery convoy and proceed from there. If things go well, we might have the location of the main distribution center. How long do you think this will take? Hopefully, soon, said Takuma. I want to hit the distribution center as fast as possible before they get a whiff that we are involved. Right about now, they might be thinking that the courier stole the consignment and ran away with it. And for that reason, I would like to keep this away from the media. Nothing should go out until I say it's time. Which means another mission soon. Indeed. Speaking of which, I might need additional funds for the mission. Let's discuss that after you have actionable intel that's confirmed by our sources, said Sayuri. Takuma wanted to sigh, but he had gotten used to this. Any time the matter of money came up, the subject would be changed. It wasn't that he didn't understand the budgetary conflicts between the departments, Takuma needed the money to run his small team. They ran a small weekly raid, targeting dealers much like Takuma's level when he was still dealing. But once a month, they tried to strike it big by hunting a supplier. And because of Inomoto's intel, Takuma and the narcotics task force had a 100% strike rate. Every time they had put their crosshair on someone, they had caught them with enough evidence to put them away for good and had resulted in significant disruption in the Hidden Leaf drug trade. True, Hidden Leaf Village was just one city, meaning they weren't putting any serious dent in the drug trade around the land of fire, but Takuma chose to focus on the present and deal with the problems in his home ground before looking elsewhere. Given that the distribution center is bound to be outside the village, will you be joining that mission as well? asked Sayuri. 
those in managerial positions don't remain operational in the field. I'm more hands-on, said Takuma, and well, I simply like to be involved. Lead by example. Slum with my people in the mud. I don't mind going on raids, it keeps me sharp. So you say, but you're aware spending more time away from here diminishes your chances. Takuma looked at his watch. I'm afraid I'll have to leave now. I have prior plans with Lady Uchiha, and she is a stickler for punctuality. He stood up to leave. Of course, we wouldn't want to keep her waiting. Sayuri saw him off. The woman was his boss boss. She was essentially in charge of who replaced Takuma at the narcotics task force, and he was going to be replaced, that much was set in stone. Nothing he could do was going to change that. The new outside recruits like him didn't have the power and influence yet, they hadn't had the time to assimilate. Takuma was cognizant of the fact he was a publicity case, but the need for publicity was over. The second batch of outsider recruits was already on active duty, and even if they removed him from his position, as long as optics were concerned, they were simply putting a reputable chunin slash jonin over a team of jinin, which still put Takuma in a good position. But Takuma wasn't satisfied with that. He could have made a power play if he had more time, but he lacked the support, and the narcotics task force was too valuable. He couldn't even get Arisu to have the Fuma clan back him up. Why would they back him up when they could make a play for the narcotics task force for themselves? If he was being honest, he had no way to maintain his position in the narcotics task force. He didn't have enough leverage to keep his position. His achievements weren't enough, politics still held more weight. He only had one card, meta knowledge. Takuma stepped out of the headquarters and stared at the bright sun. He knew the Uchiha were going to die soon, and when they did, he would be the prime candidate to lead the unit. With the Uchiha gone, all the other important positions will open up for the pickings, and one little task force would be easy to acquire, then his achievement would be enough as the value of the narcotics task force would significantly weaken in terms of politics. However, with every passing week, the plan's viability seemed to dwindle a little. Takuma didn't have an exact idea of when the Uchiha massacre took place, but he knew that it was high time it happened. But, Uchiha Shursui was still alive, and every day that man lived, the more Takuma feared that something had changed. He had no proof that things had changed. He had tried to get some information about the Uchiha coup, but if evidence was that easy to find, then other clans would have already found it. Even though he worked in the police force, he was as blind as an ostrich with his head in the sand. Takuma sighed. It was tough working among the walking dead. Sir, the information you asked about the farm raid, said the subordinate. The emotionless, middle-aged man behind the desk with buzz-cut light brown hair looked up from his desk. Report, he said. The raid was conducted by the Leaf Military Police Force. The Narcotics Task Force and the Department of Organized Crime responded the young, equally emotionless subordinate. I believe that's a new task force. Yes, sir. The subordinate placed a file on the table. Led by a jinin called Takuma, graduated from the academy two and a half years ago. An orphan of no notable lineage. He founded the narcotics task force nine months ago. Under his leadership, the task force has conducted several significant raids around the Hidden Leaf. He was present on the farm raid as the lead. The rest of the people involved in the raid are on the file. The man picked up the file and flipped through it. Three teams filled with clan shinobi, he said. Anything else notable about this Takuma? The subordinate placed a second file on the table. He was involved in the hidden frost incident we engineered. He was trained by Mariboshi Kosuk during his last year at the academy. Fights in the underground gladiator arena ring under the stage named Scars. And he is currently being tutored by Jonin Uchihamakoto, the wife of Achiha Fugaku. The last sentence got a reaction from the man. The nature of their relationship, he asked. Strictly teacher-student. Additionally, we sent one of our own into the police force as part of their new recruits. According to the information, Takuma is about to lose the command of the narcotics task force. No notable parentage, Mariboshi Kosuk, 
while, as connections won't present a problem, about to lose his important position, and a police force officer who moonlights as an underground prizefighter that crosses the Uchiha connection. He looked up at his subordinate. What is the status of the trainees? Our trainees? Yes, the current batch. Are they ready for a joint mission? I'll relay the request to the master instruction. May I ask what this mission pertains to? Assassination of a Threat to the Foundation Chapter 155, Jinjutsu Genuous Biting a Chunin in a Jinjutsu You have come far, said Makoto, smiling. I remember the last time you couldn't exclude others from getting trapped by the Jinjutsu. Isn't it good that we worked on that? The Jinjutsu would have been useless if I caught my teammates in the Jinjutsu. Takuma sipped on the tea he had gotten so used to drinking for the past several months. He didn't like tea. At first, he couldn't refuse because he didn't want to offend Makoto, but by the time he got comfortable enough, he had developed a taste for it. Takuma sighed. But, in that fight, I didn't feel like I had enough range. I know you said to train with the five I have, but I really need a couple more Jinjutsu of the visual, audible, and olfactory jutsu. Flower Hill is a momentary trap, and Miss Servant is better for crowd control than going against a stronger opponent. Are you saying you don't consider those two jutsu useful? she asked. I didn't say that. They have different uses, which I just mentioned. But I felt like I needed more options. That guy bulldozed anything I threw at him. Sure, I was chipping away at him, but he was doing the same, and he had much more wood to chip away than me. The Jinjutsu gave me the key to put him down, and I need more jackpot keys like that. Ever since he had started training under Makoto, she had restricted him to the five Jinjutsu he knew. For the past nine months, he only trained those five Jinjutsu and nothing else. Between theory lessons and having deep discussions about the philosophy behind Jinjutsu, Makoto had made sure Takuma could cast the five Jinjutsu in his sleep. I can't stop you if you want to learn more but I believe it's time to move to the next stage, she said. Next stage? You like haze, right? Takuma nodded. Jinjutsu, haze was a tactile, touch-based, jinjutsu that worked through contact. He couldn't use it because of the restrictions around a touch-based jinjutsu during a battle, but he found the distorted vision caused by the jinjutsu just so useful. He wished haze had been a visual or auditory jutsu. It's time for you to learn how to change the connection component. Takuma perked up, sitting up straighter. The connection component was the sense target to plant the Jinjutsu. Bell Clone Jutsu was an auditory Jutsu, meaning it used sound to cast the Jinjutsu, but the connection component could be changed. You should change Haze's connection component from touch to vision, said Makoto. They had talked about the topic several times. Takuma knew they would be doing it somewhere along the line, but he didn't think it would come soon. Shouldn't I first learn a few Sirink Jinjutsu, he asked. Mikoto sighed. I can't stop you, but as we discussed, pre-made Jinjutsu are crutches. You have to create your own and to do that, you need to understand the components. These five Jinjutsu are a good sample set. Experiment with them and see what you can make from them before deciding if you want more practice material. She smiled. I'm here to help you start your Jinjutsu journey. I'll be there to help you along every step until you're ready to spread your wings and take flight. Takuma clenched his fist as his breath hitched for a moment. Don't. You know how it would end. He looked up at the woman before him. She was the only other person after Mariboshi to have taught him as a teacher. A few more months more, and she would have taught him as long as Mariboshi had done. She even knew his secret like Mariboshi. But she wasn't as close to him as Mariboshi was, he hadn't let that happen. Thank you, ma'am, for everything. A figure sat atop the colossal sculpture of the fourth Hokage's face carved into the Hokage rock. The mountain shadow hid him from view as he gazed upon the hidden leaf village. One red-eye stared from behind the one-eyed orange mask with black stripes. The mask was framed by long black hair that reached the mid-back. Uchiha Bido, or was it Uchiha Madara now, stared at the village that was once his home. The village was peaceful. The people went on enjoying their lives. 
even when she was no longer in the world, they continued to live on as though nothing had changed. He looked around the village. Anywhere he looked, a memory or two would surface. Happy memories, or at least, they were once happy. Now, everything seemed washed with an unfeeling gray. No matter where he looked, a sickening feeling grew in his heart. He placed his hand on his heart. It had been a while since he had felt anything, even though it wasn't pleasant, he was glad he felt anything. His feelings were a reminder of his goal. To rid the world of the ugly. To achieve absolute peace. Are you sure it was wise to join hands with Shimura Danzo? He glanced to the side to see a black head of Zetsu poking out of the mountain stone. The strange creature was his closest ally and had been with him since the day he had been reborn. He was among the only few who knew the complete secret of the Eye of the Moon plan. Perhaps it was not, he sighed. He had wished to exact some revenge on the hidden leaf and thought approaching Danzo would be the way to go. He had heard much about the old fossil's reputation and knew about his desire to become the Hokage. And he also knew that Danzo was the opposite of everything the hidden leaf's will of fire stood for, and placing Danzo as the Hokage and seeing him twisted into his image would be a perfect revenge. It wasn't as straightforward as having the entire village and its people crushed to the core, but he thought it was enough. But who knew that despite Danzo's reputation, the old man would possess a twisted sense of protection towards the village. He wanted the Hidden Leaf Village to remain the strongest, and anything that threatened that, Danzo would go to great lengths to eliminate it. He wouldn't allow us to destroy the village. After all, what kind of king would want to rule over a broken kingdom? Abito had no desire to go against Danzo at the current point. The Akatsuki was currently busy with working missions to amass funds, plant spies, and ensure the members were happy so they would continue to remain in the group, not all were like Kisame, who truly understood the importance of their mission. You should have given Orochimaru's words more thought, said Zetsu. Orochimaru had warned him against Danzo. The snake Sanin had told them that if Akatsuki was to engage with Danzo in dealings, they needed to be very careful because if they gave Danzo any chance, he would backstab them if it benefited him in any way. At least we have him as an ally for now, said Abito. Danzo had hired the Akatsuki for some matter involved with the current proxy war between the Hidden Leaf and Hidden Storm. It wasn't as big as Anoki had them do for the Hidden Stone, but Danzo was a new customer, and it was normal for him to be cautious. However, Abito had no desire to help the Hidden Leaf. Akatsuki would complete Danzo's request and increase his political influence based on his war achievements, but they would also make sure the Hidden Leaf suffered deeply in this war, deep enough that it would hurt, and they would have to work for years to write. Abito looked down at the village and suddenly spotted a child with bright yellow hair running in the streets with a shinobi on his tail. Uzumaki Naruto His sensei's beloved child if it were in the past, he would have felt something, but now, as he watched the child, he felt nothing in his heart. It's not your time yet. His whispered words flew with the wind. In a plain room with chairs, with built-in desks, a group of four young early teens sat facing a cork board with an adult man addressing him. All the people in the room had emotionless faces. This is the target for your mission. The man used a telescopic teacher's pointer to point at an image. The target's name is Takuma. The target is a genin of the Hidden Leaf and currently serves as a senior officer in the Leaf Military Police Force. He is in charge of the Narcotics Task Force. Your mission is to assassinate him. The dossiers in front of you have some basic information about him, but as part of this mission, you will be required to collect intel on your target and use it to complete the mission as efficiently as possible. One of the teens raised their hands up. Why is the target being assassinated? The man stared at the young teen for a moment. The children here hadn't been through their final initiation yet and had yet to be turned into perfect soldiers. And the one who asked the question was the youngest and apparently needed some more guidance. He made a mental note to communicate it to the master instructor. The target moonlights as a prize fighter and has built connections with the Hidden Leaf Underworld. Our intel tells us that he has been taking bribes and is a deeply corrupt officer. He has let several groups operate without fear from the police force and is illegitimately profiting from it. 
the Foundation has decided it has become imperative to remove him and set things right. It was all false as the target had been culling drug groups inside the hidden leaf at an unprecedented rate. But it was bound to cause problems to the Foundation sooner or later. It was better to remove the head and let someone less effective take the position. Until the trainees stopped asking unnecessary questions and completed their training, painting a negative narrative was an effective method to have them cooperate. Understood, said the young teen trainee. The man nodded. The target is proficient in Jinjutsu, utilizes earth and water release ninjutsu, and is a Jinjutsu user. His experience as a prize fighter has earned him extensive experience in unarmored combat, expect him to have great close combat defense. The combat recommendation against the target is to always work in duos to minimize the danger against Jinjutsu. Do not underestimate the target. He has actual on-field combat and once traversed through an enemy state on his own after a mission with injuries, giving him some survival ability. He didn't think the four trainees were ready to be on active duty as root operatives, but taking a single Jinin was well under their ability. If there was one thing he could think as a point of difficulty was the location. The target is situated in a hidden leaf, which means based on where you decide to assassinate him, you risk external interference from other shinobi. Take that into consideration while drafting your plan and, more importantly, your exit strategy. You can't leave any evidence behind. The man gazed at the four trainees. Within a year, only two of them will survive. And the two who would survive would need to kill the other two to become true operatives. He wondered which two of the four would move on to to the final stage of their training. A memory of a boy flashed through his eyes, but it faded away as soon as it came up. The memory once felt like he had been stabbed in the heart with a thousand needles, but now it just elicited a dull feeling. He had done so and so will these boys. Chapter 156 The Foundations Why didn't you order anything, said Sango after handing the menu to the waiter. Takuma took a sip of water. I don't like to eat immediately after fights, he said. He had just finished a ninjutsu fight at the ring, and instead of taking her usual payment, Sango had asked him to treat her to a meal. He didn't mind taking his irionin to dinner. Nutrition and rest, two cornerstones of recovery. You should ensure that your body has enough resources to heal, said Sango, nagging as usual when it came to personal health. I'll eat when I return home, not just now, he sighed. The fight had been boring as usual, boring was good, Thrill-seeking risk was overrated, but he wanted a challenge, or what use was him fighting in the ring except for Rio and mission points. Well, it at least kept his body, mind, and instinct sharp, it didn't take much time for those things to dull. Rest well today, and do not forget to drink the mixture I gave you with hot water before you sleep, she said. Takuma shrugged. His opponent today had already fought him twice before, and Takuma no longer had any secrets, except for his Jinjutsu, in the ring. All of his Ninjutsu were already noted by the various teams across the ring. They had been devising tactics to defeat him, and because he fought more fights than any other fighter of his class, they had plenty of time for trial and error improvement. In some ways, Takuma influenced how the upper hierarchy of the ring fighters fought. His opponent today was a skilled lightning release ninjutsu user, the worst compatibility against Takuma, who was proficient with earth and water release. Injuries were inevitable in the ring because of the flimsy leather armor they allowed in the ninjutsu category, but today he had been squarely hit by a C-rank lightning jutsu in his chest. He had won the fight, but even after Sango's treatment, he still felt the burn, sting, and pain in and out of his chest. According to Sango, it would take a couple of days before he felt comfortable. His pain tolerance threshold had improved leaps and bounds ever since he had joined the ring, but even if he could tolerate the pain, it didn't mean it didn't hurt. He hated when his body didn't behave how he wanted it to. The bastard pulled a new trick today, he spitefully remarked. When several ring teams were planning to take him down, it was obvious they would come out with good plans. Every few fights, one strategy was bound to work, and Takuma had been grateful that they did. The more flaws his opponents discovered, the more he could weed them out and improve himself. He was the sword, and the ring was his whetstone. 
When was the last time you met Inomoto Sensei? asked Sango. I met him in passing a good while back, Takuma replied. The last time he met him was a month back. Even though Sango was Inomoto's apprentice, Takuma and Inomoto's dealing were private. It was the only way for their secret to remain airtight. Both Inomoto and Takuma would suffer loss if their secret was to be leaked. Sango hummed idly as she gazed at him. What? he asked. You have changed. How so? You're calmer than before. Back when you were just entering the weapons category, you were much more twitchy, as if there was a threat behind every corner, ready to pounce at you. You seem settled down now, it's a welcome change. Takuma quirked his brow before sighing. He could see her point. Ever since he had taken over the command at the Narcotics Task Force, he had to manage a team of people. Working alone was easier than managing a group of people. He was so concerned with building the task force, introducing and training his subordinates about the drug trade in the Hidden Leaf that it left no time for him to worry about the other problems. I will be leaving Inomoto's apprenticeship soon, said Sango. Really? The declaration took Takuma by surprise. As long as Takuma had known Sango, she had been Inomoto's student. He hadn't seen him train her as they usually met in the ring after his fights, but he assumed he was doing something akin to a teacher. An opportunity that I've been aiming for recently opened up. I got the offer recently. I got in, she smiled. Congratulations. Takuma was genuinely happy for her. She had been there every step of his journey through the ring, having seen him through all his lows and highs. He was delighted that he got to be there to see her accomplish a goal. What's the new gig? When do you start? Takuma. I'll be leading the ring. I won't be able to heal you any more after the fights, said Sango. Takuma's smile slipped after the moment of confusion passed. He leaned against the backrest and stared at Sango. The thought she would be leading him hadn't crossed his mind. He was still very much happy for her, but he couldn't ignore how Sango leaving made him feel. He wasn't averse to change, but this change made him uncomfortable. You don't have to make that face, Takuma said to Sango upon seeing her worried face. I will be fine. I'm in the ninjutsu category now. The ring will provide me with as much healing I demand from them. I'll just have to get used to trusting my body to another Irionin, that's going to be a pain. I'll recommend you a good one, said Sango. They aren't as good as me, but they'll do just fine. Takuma smiled. Don't be a stranger, okay, he said. Drop by time to time. In some strange way, I'll miss you extorting me for exorbitant meals. Call me any time you want to spend time with a lady, Sango grinned. Pfft, a lady, Takuma chortled. Fuck off, short stack. I'm still growing. Sango had her fill of food and drinks, and they eventually parted ways, but before they split up, Sango said, I don't think we will be strangers, Takuma. I will probably end up working with you in the future. Takuma was confused, but before he could ask, Sango disappeared using the body flicker jutsu. What did that mean, he mused to himself to no avail. The moon had pulled up into the starry sky by the time the meal with Sango ended. Takuma wanted to take a leisurely walk and take some alone time to retrospect, but he didn't have the time. He had to go home, have his meal, do meal prep for the next day, and complete his other chores. By the time he would do that, it would be time to sleep. He could only enjoy the view of the village's nightlife as he briskly traveled atop rooftops. Soon he reached the part of town where he resided. Not many people knew Takuma lived in a shady dump of a neighborhood. Not many would believe that a senior officer of the police force lived in a place like that. Takuma could have moved, but he liked his small apartment. It had begun to become a bit crowded with his ever-growing belongings, but Takuma managed. He enjoyed the secluded silence of the place even though it was offset by the low-grade locality. Takuma's house was only safe because people knew he was a shinobi and an officer of the police force because of his uniform. They didn't dare mess with him because what might he do to them if they did? His keys jingled as he reached his door. As he slotted the keys, he heard a sound that he almost missed. 
he would have if his hearing hadn't been enhanced by relentless training. In a split second, his senses went into hyperdrive, pushing his entire being into combat mode. He jerked to the side a moment before a kunai whistle passed his ear, thumping into the wooden door. Before he could react further, another noise reached his ears. His eyes widened at the door, and he jumped back as fast as his body allowed it. As he jumped back, a sword pierced from behind the door, reaching for Takuma's gut. His eyes remained affixed on the glimmering blade as it narrowly fell short to reach his heart. Takuma slammed into the wall of the open hallway. Two, he thought, there were at least two assailants. Takuma looked down at the bottom of the door, where a white paper sat undisturbed. The ends of the paper slip were stuck to the door panel and frame. Any attempts to open the door would rip the flimsy piece of paper, but the slip was still whole, and yet, there was someone inside his home. That could only mean three things, the assailants either came in through the balcony window, or they noticed the paper slip trick when they opened the door and fixed it, or they were observing him and knew that he put a fresh paper slip every time he left home. He went for the worst-case scenario, the last option. He immediately assumed that the assailants had vital information about him. As the thought had barely ended, Takuma felt a shiver go down his spine as two masked and robed figures emerged from the shadows in the hallway, one from each side. Simultaneously, the sword in the door was pulled back. The person behind the door was about to make their second move. Takuma's mind raced. The hallway was too narrow, and moving either side would trap him between the two flanking him. If he jumped out of the hallway, he would be vulnerable in the air, unable to change his direction, giving the one who threw the first kunai to nail him with ease. He needed to get down on the street to have some space to assess his situation. He couldn't go left, right, up, down, or back, which left only one direction. Takuma gritted his teeth and rammed his shoulder into his own door. The entire thing snapped off its hinges, and Takuma felt the door slam into the person behind it. He didn't have time to think, he stepped on the door, and the person beneath it, and ran deeper into the house. Takuma clicked his tongue. It was clear that the group of assailants was either trying to kill him or at least capture him. He didn't want either. He wanted to grab more weapons, explosive tags, smoke bombs, and whatnot, but he, unfortunately, didn't have them in a ready-to-grab package he could yank in a second. He had to do with what he had on hand. He rushed to the balcony and smashed through the glass door and jumped down into the narrow back street with the sound of glass shattering filling the silent neighborhood. It took a few mere seconds for two figures to jump down as well, but by that time, Takuma had reached the end of the street. He weaved hand seals, and a clone appeared from a plume of smoke. Takuma turned right while the clone sprinted to the left. It was the clone jutsu, creating a simply illusory jutsu, but with night time and no street lights due to the poor locality, the limitation of no shadow was eliminated. Takuma's steps didn't make much sound, a discipline he had trained to use in conjunction with the hidden Miss Jutsu. He made sure they saw him, and now the only for them to pursue him was to split up. They outnumbered him, they might have planned about this, researched him, but they had chosen the wrong place to take him on. This was his neighborhood. He knew the terrain better than anyone else. No matter how much they researched him, as long as they were in his neighborhood under the cover of the night sky, he nullified their numbers' advantage to some degree. As Takuma finally had some breathing room to think, the question finally popped in his mind. Who the fuck were these people? Chapter 157 In the Mist The clone Jutsu Gambit was successful, but it only gained Takuma a few seconds, which he knew. However, a few seconds of stillness in a fight was all one could hope for. This was the first time after the Frost mission he had faced the element of surprise, but this was the first time he was the sole target. The four assailants coming after him were solely interested in taking his life. He climbed up a building wall and stopped in the middle and stared down at the figure running at him. They were dressed in complete black with a gray mask peeking behind the hood. He slipped a hand into his weapon's pouch and tied one of his few explosive tag to a kunai as he wondered about the identity behind the assassins. His thoughts immediately zeroed in on the drug trade. It was obvious that his recent mission had threatened the drug lords, 
by taking action outside hidden leaf borders, he had set a dangerous precedent, and this could be their attempt to take him out. He was an easy, low-risk target because of his background, and taking him out would definitely force the narcotics task force to review their future plans. As the man neared, Takuma threw the kunai with an explosive tag on its tail. The question was, who was it? Which one of the drug lords had ordered the hit? Takuma felt very invested in finding the scum who had ordered the hit and then beat them to the inch of their lives. The tag exploded, and the man was thrown back to the ground. Takuma didn't wait to see the man reattain his balance before hitting the ground, he immediately turned his back to block a kunai from another assailant with his own. That was all the rest he got. I'm afraid this is not how one makes friends, said Takuma as he pushed the man up the wall. If you wanted to talk, I have recently developed a taste for tea. We can chat over a late night tea session. He got no response from the man. Takuma didn't mind, he wasn't expecting them to speak up from the get go, and he had more time to flare some choice words out of him. Takuma sent Chakra to his souls. The wall beneath him cracked, and he jumped high just when the second man reached him on the wall. He leaped over him and landed down on the road. The moment his feet landed on the ground, he took off again just a moment before a large volley of shuriken could butcher. He wasn't given a second of rest as three men surrounded him with swords drawn. A kunai each slipped into his hands, and the moment the steel gleamed, the three men charged. Takuma clicked his tongue and moved. He caught a sword between his kunai and used his full force to push him away and began a mental stopwatch of three seconds. He turned back and launched the two kunai towards the second man, who used his sword to block them, the force behind the kunai sent sparks out on impact, but by that time, Takuma had already moved to the third man. Takuma dodged a slash for his torso and followed with a lashing kick augmented by Chakra, number three blocked the strike but was pushed back a few feet. Resilient, thought Takuma when his strike didn't blow away the no number three. These days, his ring opponents spent most of their time in the arena dodging his strikes because every hit slashed away at their chances of victory by a significant percentage. The three-second stopwatch went off and Takuma returned back to no number one. The man was fast with his sword and right from the bat, had better kinjutsu skills than any other ring fighter Takuma had faced, Takuma had to move his entire body constantly so as not to get cut by the sharp blade. Within a breath, the three men were back on Takuma, and he pulled all of his 2v1 experience in the ring to handle three men, which was difficult. Not only were there three men for him to handle, but they were also better at collaborative combat than any pair Takuma had fought. In less than 15 seconds, he had gotten half a dozen cuts on his body. But in return, Takuma did some damage to their clothes as well. He tore no hashtag one's hood, shredded one of no hashtag two's sleeves, and slit the hem of no hashtag three's robe. They wore exactly the same attires from the boots, to the robe, to the mask, he had to distinguish themselves at a glance to better recognize who was who while he got to understand their combat quirks. Suddenly, the three men jumped far away from Takuma simultaneously. The answer came before Takuma even had the chance to be confused. He felt a heat and looked up to see multiple basketball-sized fireballs descending towards him. Shit! Takuma immediately weaved the three hand seals for body flicker jutsu, but the moment he pushed off at inhuman speeds, the fireballs hit the ground, and an explosive force slammed into Takuma along with the blasted pieces of road pavement. He hit the wall with his front side, barely protecting his face. What he couldn't protect was his injured chest from his ring fight. His ribs made hard contact with a concrete wall, and whatever Sango's work had done was undone in an instant. Takuma felt the taste of iron invade his mouth, and he knew there was some level of internal bleeding. He gritted his teeth as he slid down the wall to grasp control over himself before he even landed on the ground, no number two sped towards him with a sword. Takuma let his knees buckle to avoid a head decapitation strike, but the pain in his chest didn't allow him to escape from the corner he had been trapped in. He went for the second best option and threw a fast-acting smoke bomb, which covered seven feet of area in thick black smoke. Bearing the pain, Takuma swept no hashtag two's legs and whipped a blind augmented kick that made contact. 
he propped himself on his knee and weaved another set of hand seals, and mist solidified in the air, plummeting the visibility in the area. Takuma rose up and took out one of the sachets Sango had given him. It was a painkiller, it wasn't an instantaneous drug, but he was hoping it would have some early semi-placebo effect. A kunai silently came out, and he assumed stealth mode as he moved around the heavy fog of the hidden mist jutsu. The lack of functioning street lights in the area already had visibility in the dumps, but with the mist filling the area, seeing anything was all but impossible even for Takuma, who was trained for combat under the mist. But against four shinobi whose combat ability was unknown, it was a trade-off Takuma was willing to make. Moreover, the longer he stretched the fight, the greater the chances for someone reporting the fight to the authorities, leading to someone from the police force arriving at the scene. He was taught to finish fights quickly, and stretching the situation for external interference went against the philosophy, but he couldn't see any other option. Escape was an unreliable option, as long as he made it to a populated region, they wouldn't dare to assassinate him there, but fighting while on the run had increased risk and vulnerability, which increased with the number of assailants. For people weren't great odds. Plus, there was a non-combat issue with running. If he, the narcotics task force's leader, ran today, he would be setting an example. If assassins could scare the leader, what would that say about the subordinates? He had to thrash this attempt right here and now so that no other drug lord would dare to send assassins after his people. And he wanted information. He didn't have to kill four trained assassins, he just needed to kill three and capture one alive. Now, where are they? Takuma's hearing sharpened as he concentrated, spreading around the empty streets. There was no ruckus. The fire release jutsu earlier ensured that none of the residents would dare come out. He simply hoped one of them would call the police force, but he also knew that the neighborhood he lived in didn't particularly love the police force, there was a chance they would instead let the situation pass before they informed the police force of the aftermath. The sound of a skid of boots against the pavement pinged Takuma's ears, and his eyes widened. He quickly whipped back and blocked the sword with his kunai. Clang! Takuma knew the sound was enough to give the others an idea of his location. He needed to move quickly. Takuma skipped back a few feet, beyond what the current visibility allowed to be seen so that he could slip away, but the figure jolted forward, not allowing Takuma to escape. Fight it is then, Takuma thought. He launched ahead and aimed an augmented strike for the head, which was swiftly dodged by a quick side step. Takuma tried to follow with a quick hook kick to the chest, but his leg was grabbed. Without any hesitation, as soon as Takuma felt the grip on his foot tighten, he used the hold as a pivot to take off the ground to land an augmented blow right to the head. Bomb! Takuma felt the satisfying reverb shoot through his leg. The grip loosened, and Takuma landed on the ground. He sprang up and forward for the follow-up attack when a kick slammed into the side of his face. The man, unfazed by the augmented kick, retaliated when Takuma thought he had a clear view for a follow-up attack. The augmentation wasn't at full force due to his awkward position, but it was still enough to disorient someone for a moment, but here, it didn't seem to work. His eyes went for his marking and found the man missing a hood. It was no number one. He wondered if it was just no number one who was extra resilient or if it was everyone on the team. He added that to his combat analysis as a punch flew towards his face. He pulled his torso and head back to dodge the punch. No number one grabbed the momentum by its rein and launched a flurry of attacks on Takuma, who went on the defensive as he bobbed and weaved out of every single strike. Not a single attack after the initial kick touched Takuma. And when he was ready, Takuma retaliated. He slammed the body shot into the pit of no hashtag one's abdomen. An elbow strike assaulted the head next. Takuma grabbed no number one by his shoulder to finish the combo and pulled him down for an augmented knee strike into the chest. Come on, bitch, he whispered just loud enough so that no number one could hear. No number one stumbled back to make space but immediately shot forward. Takuma could hear every exhalation that preceded a strike. The time between the two events was extremely short, and usually, there was no use in tracking the exhalation pattern, but now, with zero visibility, Takuma used that breathing pattern to his advantage. 
No number one unleashed a flurry of sword strikes that Takuma dodged or blocked. They weren't as sharp and precise as before, the mist obstructing the vision was paying off. He sidestepped a sword jab and returned a low kick to the thigh that hobbled no number one. Takuma closed the distance, but the trained assassin wasn't one to go down easily, his sword hissed as it came for Takuma's neck. He diverted at the last second by his kunai so that it could only tear the fabric over his shoulder. Crack! Takuma's strongest augmentation fist made unobstructed contact with the chest. He felt the familiar sensation of rib bones moving under the force of chakra that shot out from his fist. I'm better than you at this, Takuma spat. But unlike you, he's not alone. The voice was followed by a low shrill of a sword and moved out of the way. However, the sword caught his upper arm and left a deep gash. Takuma hissed in pain, but the twisted expression stayed on his face only for a second, soon replaced by a large grin. So, you guys can speak, Takuma laughed, but he didn't feel good about it. Chapter 158, Badass Takuma Multiple opponents, help was readily available, something he had recently taken advantage of against a difficult chunin. He turned back to the second man and recognized him as no number three. I must confess, I don't believe I am someone important enough to warrant an assassination, said Takuma. So, before I die, tell me who ordered this hit. You don't need to know, no number three rushed him. Takuma crossed his arm to block a punch that Takuma weaved back, making it miss by the width of a finger. Takuma tried to pull away, but no number three stuck close, targeting Takuma's top to bottom, landing precise strikes in places that hit. Takuma didn't fall short and managed to disarm the sword on top of getting a couple of soft augmented hits and that did more overall damage. Come on, can't you give a dead man his last wish? asked Takuma as he swung the sword at its owner. He then immediately turned and used the sword to block a sword strike from no number two. It's not that I'm asking too much, and this won't jeopardize your mission, or is it that you are afraid that I'll kill you and live to tell the tale? No number two immediately became more aggressive. Takuma smiled internally and let the man think he had control of the momentum as no number three joined the fight. A 2v1 was just the way Takuma liked it. He observed the two. He hadn't noticed it before, but both no number three and no number two had shockingly similar fighting styles, the same went for no number one. They had their quirks and adjustments unique to them, but they followed the same combat style, one Takuma hadn't faced yet, which told him that they were trained at the same source, but more importantly, they were trained at the source. No number two quite easily disarmed Takuma off the sword he had stolen from no number three, who tried to reach for it, but Takuma kicked the sword away. No number two used the opportunity to smash his knee into Takuma's face, disorienting him for a moment, which gave no number three the opening to lay down a lethal combo of a punch to the liver, a palm strike to the chest, which sent Takuma's injury flare up worse than a wildfire, and he finished with a lacerating kunai strike to Takuma's shoulder right shoulder. Takuma barely raised his arm to block no hashtag two's downward strike. The sword clanged against his metal arm bracer, he didn't cut, but the power behind his strike sent a shock up Takuma's arm, he could already feel the bruise forming. Takuma swept no hashtag to his feet, but he jumped at the last second, and while in midair, no number two threw his word to no number three as Takuma watched the blade fly over him and landed in no hashtag three's grip, who swung it down without missing a beat. Takuma moved but got a deep gash on his face. Takuma's first instinct was to open his eyes wide to check if his eyes were cut, but he could still see normally. The pain, however, ended Takuma's information collection process. He wanted to study their moves and observe their teamwork strategies more, but it was clear that he no longer had the luxury. He grunted and jumped No. 2, who didn't have a sword and took him to the ground. No. 2 need him in the crouch. Takuma grunted in agony but snarled as he went for a kunai in the stomach that was deflected and ended up in a gash to the side. His instincts screamed, and Takuma grabbed No. 2 and pulled him atop, leading No. 3 to slash his teammate. No number three managed to pull back his swing at the last moment, but not before it had drawn some blood. Takuma yelled as he threw no number two into the presumably startled no number three before scampering off into the mist. 
Takuma coughed and felt the taste of iron grow heavy. His face burned from the cut, the only silver lining was that the cut was below his eyes, which meant blood wouldn't drip onto his eyes, hindering his vision. Bearing through the pain, Takuma weaved hand seals and slipped underground like fish in water using the hiding in the rock jutsu. He emerged in a different position inside the mist and closed his eyes to concentrate on the sounds. The sound of dull metal rang in his ear. No number two or no number three had retrieved the discarded sword. He focused harder and heard the faint sounds of boots against the hard ground. The assassins were clearly trained to walk quietly, and they were clearly trying to cover their tracks more now that they had no idea where Takuma was, but as Takuma had said, he was better than them at stealth. He stood up straight, resisting the pain to his shoulder and sides, and slowly weaved hand seals as he walked towards the sounds. He eventually came to a stop at a distance he thought would alert the two men and stood in silence. With each passing second, holding the chakra building up in his body from the hand seals made it difficult, but he persisted. It was extremely difficult and straining to hold chakra created actively for a jutsu, but he needed them in the proper position. The more he concentrated, the more Takuma heard his own heartbeat pumping faster due to the adrenaline, exertion, and blood loss. Holding chakra made his injured chest hurt, as though the chakra was threatening to tear his flesh and bones apart to jump out. The two sounds slowly moved closer, closer to him and each other, until they were inside Takuma's strike zone. Water release, wild water wave. Takuma sucked in deep as the chakra bubbled with vigor inside his body before unleashing a large torrid water wave that hit the two at full force from a shockingly low distance only achievable by the fog from the hidden mist jutsu that kept Takuma's position hidden. The sound of water splashing and hitting drowned out all the others, making Takuma lose no number two and no number three, but he didn't stop and began weaving more hand seals. Before Takuma could complete the hand seals, a voice hit his ear, it came from the opposite direction. Takuma abandoned the hand seals, letting the chakra go to waste. He skidded his boots against the ground, making ample sound, and then took a high leap into the air. There was no danger of getting sniped in the air because of the fog. Takuma weaved a new set of hand seals, and arcs of lightning buzzed around his arm, culminating in front of his palm. The lightning from lightning release, shock made a crackling noise, echoing loudly in the silent surroundings. The ugly grin on Takuma's pulled on his wound, flaring up the pain, as he dropped down from the sky and shoved the mass of lightning at point-blank range in no hashtag one's back. It was Takuma's weakest jutsu, but it stung like hell when shoved directly into the body. No number one screamed bloody, and Takuma pulled out a kunai to finish the deal when he felt someone sneak behind him. He pushed no number one and whipped back to block a dagger. The figure was once again dressed in exactly the same attire, but the clothes weren't damaged in any way. Number four, Takuma almost blurted out, but he kept it quiet in case the assassins realized he was cataloging them by their clothes. He got no response. No number four swung his dagger in an aggressive dance with speed and a deadly technique. Takuma found his hand manipulated, every one of no hashtag four strikes was deliberately placed in attempts to pull Takuma's hand to a position that would make a defense against the next strike difficult. It was a masterful display of precision and understanding of the human body and knife work to be able to pull it off. He had never faced such an opponent, someone with such high skill. Takuma fared well at the start, but eventually, no number four got in a strike on Takuma's lower arm, which opened up a suite of opportunities that were immediately cashed in. Within the next couple of seconds, no number four moved quicker than ever and left multiple minor but painful cuts across his body. As Takuma hobbled, a light green glow appeared around no hashtag for his left hand. A feeling of fear bubbled up inside Takuma. For the first moment, he didn't realize what the glow was, but the moment no number four stepped towards him, the recognition alarmed in his mind. It looked like an Irionin's healing jutsu. No number four was an Irionin. The assassination team had an Irionin. The danger assessment inside Takuma's head went up two levels. A team with an Irionin was a threat, and this one seemed to be proficient in combat as well. There was no way no number four would heal him, which only meant that no number four was trying to do the opposite. 
Takuma recalled a conversation with Uchiha Kano about how, with some adjustments, an Irionin could turn one of their healing jutsu into something that could sever muscles and fry the nerves. Takuma couldn't afford that. But as he shifted his foot, a jolt of pain from his leg almost destroyed his balance. Takuma was sure it was no hashtag for his skillful knife work mixed with his knowledge of human anatomy. He went for the emergency measure. Takuma threw the kunai in his hand at no number four, buying him a second, which he used to take out his lowest grade explosive tag, which he triggered instantly before throwing it in between them. The tag wasn't anchored to a kunai, so it fluttered in the air with the edges burning. It was a gambit he had used before, but this time, the stakes were higher as he had triggered the tag. He couldn't afford no number four missing the tag because of the fog. No number four froze up and leaped back as the tag exploded, while Takuma could only contract into a tight fetal position, covering his head and ears as the explosive force slammed against him. Takuma was thrown away and ragdolled against the ground several times. Pain. That was all Takuma could feel. How long had it been since he had felt this amount of pain? Even the chunin from the police force raid hadn't pushed him this far. It was in his early days of ring when he had felt so much pain, when he was forced to armor less, and his defense wasn't as good as it was today, which made deep stabs and gashes common after match. He had not missed the feeling at all, but he couldn't deny that it brought a sense of strange calm. In the face of real danger, his mind was clear. Perhaps, the existential dread he had carried with him in his first and even some part of the second year of his life in this world had tempered his mental resiliency, the possibility of imminent death didn't seem as terrifying as he thought. Takuma weaved hand seals, and he felt a connection established to puddles or water around him. The liquid rose and flowed behind with a fervor, forming a large blob. He flexed his back muscles with as much pain, and eight glorious water tentacles shot out of the blob. Takuma took out two more of Sango's painkiller sachets and poured the awfully bitter powder into his mouth. One of the tentacles rose and dropped a mouthful of dirty water into Takuma's mouth to help him down the medicine. He skipped double-dosing to directly triple-dosing himself. Takuma wished he had a soldier pill, but this was his only option. Chapter 159, Assassin Derby Six while moving, seven while stationary. That was Takuma's limit with eight tentacles jutsu. But today, that wasn't something that would work today. He was injured, and the four assassins had an Irionin among them, which meant they had slightly less to worry about injuries, but even that small concession turned into a huge advantage when there was only one opponent to fight against. First order of business, take out no number four, once the Irionin was out, the other three would become more cautious, which Takuma would exploit aggressively. The tentacles rose as Takuma knelt down and placed his palms on the ground after weaving hand seals for earth tremor since jutsu. A ripple went through the ground, which returned with tactile information for Takuma to interpret. When Takuma had first trained the jutsu, he could only see the presence of people in a one-kilometer area, he couldn't tell their direction or their exact distance from him. The jutsu returned too much data, and Takuma only knew how to interpret some of it. Now though, after more than a year of gradually training the jutsu, he had learned to identify the direction the target was in. He still couldn't tell their exact distance from him, but that would come with more training. Takuma tuned out everything past the cross-section they were fighting in, and as he expected, there were only four people in his immediate surroundings. Two of them were alone and moving slowly around in the fog, while the other two were huddled together. Takuma was sure one of them was the Irionin. It was a stupid move to not move up into one of the buildings and do treatment on higher ground, but a mistake he was thankful for. Disregarding chakra consumption, Takuma weaved another set of hand seals and performed another ninjutsu. He sunk into the ground as hiding in the rock jutsu became the mode of traversal for him. No number four had his glowing hand placed on his chest, healing the gruesome burn injury that had scorched his skin and bruised his ribs underneath. His mask had a crack on it from the explosive tag. If he had not jumped before the tag had exploded, he would be in a much worse condition. They had the wrong intel. The target was a maniac. Who used an explosive tag at such close range? 
He knew of the explosive tag scare tactic due to its effectiveness, but it didn't involve actually triggering the tag. The moment he had seen the burning tag, every instinct and logical mental process had made him jump away, which was the correct decision. The target will be heavily injured, he whispered. Understood, no number three replied. Can you proceed without healing? asked no number four. No number three had taken ninjutsu into the back, which required treatment, but with the target injured, they could finish the mission now and handle the injuries later. Affirmative, said no number three. No number four judged that his injuries were not stabilized, and he could proceed for now. His skin still hurt, and his ribs were still painful, but it wasn't the pain amount he couldn't shrug off. As he stood up, a drop of water hit his bare chest, making him alert, only to realize that it was rain. Rain, he whispered. They were having a difficult time with the hidden Miss Jutsu. They didn't have any wind-release users, they couldn't blow it away, neither did they have water-release users to override the mist. But if it rained, the mist would naturally weigh down, eliminating visibility-reducing fog. No number four almost immediately trashed the plan as he couldn't predict the intensity of rain and depending on uncontrollable natural phenomena wasn't wise. They had to find the target and eliminate him. Done, said no number four. But as they were about to move out, they heard something. No number four looked down just in time to see a figure phase out of the ground. It was the target. He ejected from the ground with eight water tentacles floating behind, each holding two kunai. The next instant, all sixteen kunai were thrown towards him from a dangerous short range. No number three immediately jumped in between the kunai and no number four. It was normal for the team to protect the Irionine, and no number four weaved hand seals despite seeing the kunai dug into no number three despite the latter's best effect to deflect them. No number four knew it would take more than some kunai to take no number three down and continued to weave hand seals for fire release, great fireball jutsu. But then the tentacles slithered like snakes and moved around no number three to grab no number four, who felt the wet liquid water held together and partially solidified using chakra wrap around his body and more importantly his hands. Before he could complete the last two hand seals, his hands were harshly pulled apart. Bomb! No number four felt a strong gust of wind and force flutter his cloak and clothes. He stared in shock as no number three in front of him slid down to the ground, leaving nothing between him and the target. The target was a mess. There was an ugly cut on the right side of his face, the left side was burned. His clothes were torn and burned with plenty of unsightly cuts and bruises that he and his team had inflicted. He could tell the target's condition was one push away from Sirius. Most would fall apart in the target's condition, he now understood why the master instructor had assembled a four-people team for a single genin. The tentacles spasmed and tightened around no hashtag four's arms, legs, and torso. He tried to resist and overpower the tentacles, but the tentacles were iron chains refusing to budge. I'll keep one alive, but that's not you, the target whispered as he thrust a kunai towards him. No number four closed his eyes, accepting his end. He was aware of the danger of the mission and knew that he could die on any mission. But he was honored to die on duty while protecting the Foundation and repay the life and purpose the Lord Commander had given to him. Nothing happened in the next moment. Clang! Clang! Ugh! No number four opened his eyes to see two metal chains bound around the target's arms who struggled against the chains. Their eyes met, and the target immediately chucked his kunai up, which was caught by an empty tentacle that struck out towards him, but before the kunai could reap his throat, the chains pulled, and the target was harshly pulled back, and no number four, bound by the tentacles, went along with him. The sudden pull disrupted the tentacle holding the kunai, lodging deep into no hashtag four's upper abdomen. He spurted blood out of his mouth. One of the chains rattled around the target's arm, and in a bright flash, a surge of lightning shot up the chain and electrocuted the target. The next moment, two arms clutched no hashtag four's arm and pulled him away from the tentacles. Are you all right, brother? asked no number one. Why ya? Yeah, replied no number four. Leave me and focus on the target. No number one and no number two put no number four down at a distance and disappeared into the fog. 
No number four felt wetness on his face, and a chill shot up through his spine, but then he looked up to see the fog clearing up as rain began to fall in earnest. He wanted to heal himself, but instead of doing that, he turned back and hobbled toward no number three. They needed to finish this now. Takuma got rid of the chains around him as his body spasmed from the lightning release jutsu. The pain in his chest was at an all-time worse as his heart burned with every beat. He was already tired from the ring fight and now felt he could collapse at any time. He looked up as rain fell on the ground, erasing his hidden miss jutsu. His biggest advantage was no more. Takuma undid his eight tentacles jutsu and let the water fall away. He weaved hand seals for eight tentacles jutsu again, and this time, the water behind his back was double the previous time. The tentacles that formed from the water blob were thicker and longer than before. He looked ahead, and as the fog dissipated, he could see two figures, but that was only momentarily as two huge fireballs bellowed toward him. Takuma calmly weaved hand seals, sucked in a deep breath, and then spat out a massive water wave towards the two searing fire jutsu. Water release, wild water wave. The water met the fire, and the flames were extinguished before they could even reach halfway. The collision released a huge amount of water vapor. Takuma didn't move and observed. His gut told him something was coming, and it turned out right as thick earth spikes flew across the air, it was an earth release jutsu, but it wasn't just that. Bright and hot flames surrounded the earth spikes. It was a combination ninjutsu. The concept was simple, use two ninjutsu in harmony to become more powerful than a simple sum of the original. Not all justa could be used together in a combination, and the two components needed to be compatible. For example, a fire-release jutsu could be boosted by a wind-release jutsu, or a lightning-release jutsu could cause more damage when conducted through a water-release jutsu. Incompatible jutsu like fire-release with water-release wouldn't work. Takuma knelt down and quickly formed hand seals before pushing his palms against the ground. Earth release, earthen dome. Takuma felt the force of the combination jutsu against his shield. He knew it wouldn't last long. Earthen dome was a derivative of a birank jutsu, and unlike the parent jutsu, it lacked the repairability. Earthen dome couldn't be repaired and strengthened by actively providing chakra after the initial expenditure. Takuma weaved hand seals for hiding in the rock jutsu to slip into the ground. As the jutsu triggered, Takuma felt a pit in the bottom of his stomach. He was familiar with the feeling, just not during battle. Perhaps for the first time in a battle, Takuma was concerned about his chakra usage. He hadn't run out, not at all, but this was the first time he had used so much in a fight, and not a single of his enemies were dead. But with the hidden mist jutsu gone, he could unleash his other specialty. No number one and no number two stared at the aftermath of their combination jutsu. The jutsu was strong enough to tear through any C-rank jutsu, and in this situation, it had also illuminated the surroundings in the form of fires and embers. Can you see the target? asked no number one. Negative, no number two replied. They looked at each other and slowly moved closer to the burn site. It's okay, I'm right here. The two assassins whipped around to spot the target standing before them with his hands together, forming a hand seal. They moved to strike the target down when the situation suddenly changed. Dozens of clones stepped out of the shadows, phasing out of the grounds, jumping down from the buildings. In a couple of moments, the entire road was filled with clones of the target, and they were completely surrounded. The two straightaway put their swords away and began forming hand seals. Takuma walked towards no number four as no number one and no number two dealt with Jinjutsu, Miss Servant Jutsu. He had gotten really good at his first Jinjutsu, he could now create an illusion of multiple dozens of clones appearing simultaneously. Takuma felt explosions go behind him. He turned to see small football-sized fireballs fly around. The explosions were followed by earth spears, Takuma had to dodge one of them. It didn't matter how many Jutsu they used, they wouldn't be able to get rid of the clones. Use more chakra, exhaust yourself, Takuma thought as he walked away from the two trapped assassins. He eventually reached his destination, where no number four was slumped against the ground, healing himself. They looked at each other, and no number four opened his mouth to yell, 
but two kunai thrown from the tentacles dug directly into his throat, instantly killing no number four. The Irionine was down. Shatter. Takuma turned back towards no number one and no number two. They broke through the Jinjutsu, and they did it fast. From their reaction to directly going for ninjutsu showed that they were deep in the thrall of the jinjutsu, aggressiveness was an indicator they completely believed the jinjutsu, which made the quick escape abnormal. Unless someone else broke them out. Takuma turned to no number four and a tight smile appeared on his face. You didn't heal yourself, did you, he whispered. And Irionin's role was to heal his teammates. No number four had done just that, he had healed no number three, who had then broken no number one and no number two out of the Jinjutsu. It was an excellent decision that snowballed into more good for the team. Good man. Takuma turned to walk away when his left leg gave away. It was so sudden that the tentacles had to prop himself to stop him from falling on pure instinct. He stared at his leg in horror, and it was shaking, but no matter how much Takuma tried, he couldn't move it at all. Chapter 160, Eight Tentacles he needed to lead his neighborhood and head to a busy main street because no help would come where Takuma lived. But to do that, he needed mobility, which he didn't have currently because of the bum leg. Takuma didn't dare look at his leg in fear the remaining three assassins would notice the glance and figure out the situation. But simultaneously, it didn't matter as they would figure it out anyway when Takuma moved. The rain was now bathing the hidden leaf. Takuma's ears were filled with the sound of the heavy showers. The rain bore down on him, making his injured body feel heavier than any ankle weight he ever had. Takuma tried to look at the situation positively as his water released jutsu gained from the heavy rain, but the rain made the situation difficult as well, his trained ears were hindered, and every single surface in the area would become slippery. Either the first dose of Sango's painkiller had kicked in, or his body was pumping enormous amounts of adrenaline through his blood because Takuma felt the pain dull a smidge, and his body felt more functional than it should be in his current condition. But with his foot not operational, he was in no condition to engage three trained assassins. He needed to escape. The water tentacles behind Takuma shifted as one tentacle turned thinner and longer as it slowly extended behind him, heading towards the dead no number four. Takuma ordered the tentacle to swipe no hashtag for his weapons pack to replenish his improvised arsenal. It was difficult as he didn't have a good view of no number four, and the rain only made it difficult. Takuma turned to look at his front when he noticed the three assassins move. They spread out and moved to surround him. The tentacle behind him snatched the weapons pack and retreated quickly. Takuma weaved hand seals for hiding in the rock jutsu and slipped into the ground. The urban landscape restricted his movement as building foundations underground made it so he couldn't just go anywhere, this would not have been a problem if he was at his best, but in his current condition, going any deeper than just below the surface wasn't possible. If he pushed it, he could end up buried alive beneath a city, never to be found. Takuma turned to follow the road and had only moved a couple of meters when he felt the ground shake. Takuma felt his jutsu fail, and without a moment's delay, Takuma jumped out of the ground. In shock, Takuma looked around to see no number one kneeling with hands on the ground. Takuma recalled the earth and spikes he had faced earlier. No number one was an earth release user. He had disrupted the ground, forcing Takuma to resurface. Fuck! There went that plan. He would need to take out no number one if he wanted to escape using hiding in the rock jutsu, but Takuma was sure they, too, realized that, which was why no number one stood a step behind no number two and no number three even though no number three was the most injured among the three. They were protecting him so that Takuma couldn't escape. As Takuma thought about what to do next, he noticed no number three looked toward no number four. It was a subtle head turn, and Takuma barely noticed it. Takuma thought about it for a moment before returning to his current predicament. As Takuma thought, no number two and no number three charged towards him. In a hurry, Takuma did the first thing that popped into his mind. Two of the eight water tentacles moved and wrapped themselves around Takuma's leg. He let his legs go limp and let his body weight be supported by the tentacles. Just treat them like feet, treat them like feet, just like feet. 
while repeating the words in his mind like a mantra, Takuma jumped back, but instead of taking a big leap, Takuma ended up with a flimsy skip. No number two and no number three rapidly closed in, and Takuma had no choice but to engage them. He dug into no hashtag for his weapons pack, and thankfully, it had a stash of kunai, which he used to arm his tentacle. Takuma felt horrible as he operated the tentacles at his feet. Without a solid base and nimble footwork, the rest of his body seemed awkward to move. It was the most awful he had felt in combat, so much so that he wanted to throw up. No number two swung his sword, and when Takuma went to the counter, the tentacle holding the kunai missed. The sword straight cut through the water tentacle. Takuma had to lurch back at the last moment to avoid the sharp edge, and due to the abrupt movement, he lost his balance and fell to the ground. Gah! Pain shot through his body as a deep cut got pulled from the fall. He had barely squinted for a split second, only to see no number three stabbing his sword down towards his chest when he refocused his eyes. With pure flight instinct, the tentacles pushed Takuma to the side, making no number three miss. Takuma's problems had just started as no number two was ready with his next attack. Takuma didn't know what to do from his current position until he remembered he had tentacles. Like whips, two tentacles assaulted no hashtag two's legs to make him stumble. Another swing from no number three threatened Takuma's life, but he didn't miss this time and successfully contested the strike. Another tentacle got in a counter-strike into no hashtag three's side, and Takuma was about to get a final lethal strike to the heart when he saw no number one in his field of vision. The next moment, a shuriken came down at him. Every tentacle lurched in front to form a barrier, but Takuma knew that the shuriken would pierce through the water, he pushed Chakra into the water to further solidify it so he could survive the attack. The pseudo wall didn't deflect the shuriken, instead, the shuriken entered the water but didn't make out the other side. Takuma didn't have the time to breathe a sigh of relief. The water tentacles moved, the shuriken floating inside moving along with them. Takuma turned the tentacles into a slingshot, flinging the shuriken out, but instead of returning fire to no number one, he aimed at no number two and no number three as they were more immediate threats. The two assassins immediately jumped out of the way of the shooting stars, but not before they could avoid all of the shuriken, some hit them, and that gave Takuma a chance to regain footing. He stood up with the tentacles wrapping around his leg. From his previous failure, Takuma was able to better control the tentacles as substitutes for his legs, he immediately headed towards an alleyway, stumbling along the way, almost falling. Even if he could move now, Takuma was nowhere near the mobility he would normally possess. Fortunately for him, Takuma knew the alleyways better than his assassins. In the night of the dark, Takuma moved through the narrow ways of the poorly planned part of the city, but today, it was all to Takuma's advantage. Not only were the alleyways narrow, but the construction companies who had built the houses had overextended the balconies beyond the assigned plots. The balconies from two opposite buildings had a distance that could be covered with a small jump, putting the balconies directly above the alleyways, which made the streets down below partially blocked and thus inaccessible from the rooftops. He weaved through the dark village, almost falling multiple times. But before Takuma even left the block, the moment he entered the first alleyway, he felt something. But the feeling disappeared almost instantaneously, and Takuma had too much on his mind to care. All of his attention was focused on operating the tentacles. His breathing was labored, the rain sapped the energy from his body, but he couldn't stop. He could feel the assassins on his tails, he could hear them over the noise. They were behind him on the road, they were atop the buildings, following him. It was Takuma's frequent twists and turns that were keeping him safe. He consciously kept away from main roads and kept to back alleys, knowing that if he gave them the space, they would nail him. He could tell that things were going well as he hadn't faced a single explosive tag to just blow him up, but he hoped they would use explosives or a flashy ninjutsu to create some commotion. That might not have done anything in his neighborhood, but it would work now as Takuma moved toward a better part of the town. Takuma was avoiding the main roads, but his aim was a large police force precinct that would have night shift officers working in the building. The precinct wasn't accessible by back alleys, and Takuma knew that very soon he would have to travel out in the open. 
Suddenly, no number two dropped at the end of the alley Takuma was halfway through. It was an alleyway that opened to a main road. Takuma got the scare of his life when he saw no number two leaving hand seals. Time slowed for Takuma, he knew he had close to no chance of avoiding a ninjutsu in the narrow alleyway, and even if he pulled off an earth release, earth and dome in time, the solid concrete buildings around slowed the dome construction and he would get hit. The other option was to disrupt the jutsu before no number three completed it, but he didn't have any kunai equipped in his hands, and the tentacles didn't have enough space to build up the momentum to whip the kunai. A jinjutsu wasn't an option, no number three was actively operating chakra for a jutsu, which meant, in that moment, he had better control of his chakra, and a jinjutsu had a higher than usual probability of failing. Takuma had less than a second to make a decision, and he made one in the moment. The tentacles around Takuma's feet tightened. There was no water below his soles, and even though one of his legs wasn't working, he could still circulate chakra into it. He pushed as much chakra he could in the moment into the water tentacle and used his good leg to jump high up just before a stream of fire engulfed everything below him. The jump was pathetic, he barely jumped to a single story height. Takuma slapped his hand on the flat surface of a balcony's outside, and his training during the basic training right out of the academy kicked in, and his hand stuck to the surface like his feet would do with chakra adhesion. His arm was strong enough to pull the weight of his body, and Takuma climbed up as fast as he could. The moment his good foot was on a surface, he kicked himself up and continued his way to the top. Takuma reached the rooftop and turned his head to see no number one and no number two behind him on another rooftop. The precinct was just a few blocks away, which meant Takuma only needed to cross a bit more distance before he could reach his destination. Takuma didn't have the leaping strength to cross the main road and onto the rooftop across the street, which meant he had to travel by road, which wasn't optimal. By the time he went down from the rooftop, no number three would be ready to mount another attack, and the other two would soon follow. But he had no choice, he had to survive his way to the precinct. Takuma turned to the front and stepped forward when tragedy struck. He slipped. Cold rain fell from the sky. Takuma's mind went blank as he found himself falling back into the narrow alleyway. He could see the future in his imagination. He would hit multiple balconies on his way down, once on the ground, he would face no number three, who would take advantage of the situation and finish him off. Even if that weren't the case, the other two wouldn't allow him to live much longer. He was as good as dead. Not yet. All eight tentacles merged into one and shot forward to wrap itself around an iron rod before pulling Takuma up and flung him into the sky. Eight tentacles jutsu wasn't meant to handle large weights. Its intended usage was to wield small weapons like kunai, shuriken, big daggers, and perhaps a sword or two, but the jutsu wasn't meant to support heavy weights and especially couldn't muster enough force to fling someone Takuma's weight into the sky. It wasn't even meant to substitute legs like Takuma was using, but he had been pumping chakra into tentacles to increase their ability to bear weight. And in the moment, he was falling, Takuma did the same, he pushed so much chakra into the tentacles that it, for a very short moment, became able to fling Takuma into the air. And because the eight tentacles jutsu wasn't meant to be utilized in such a way, it shattered immediately. As Takuma flew in the air, he turned his body mid-flight and weaved hand seals for water release, wild water wave. No number one and no number two had rushed forward and were well within the range. Water release ninjutsu had a special feature. Most of them performed significantly well when there was a body of water present nearby, or an alternate, if it was raining in the area. Takuma then ejected a wave of water, which was twice as big as the biggest wave he had ever pulled off. It wasn't just the volume, the pressure behind the water was at another level as well. No number one and no number two had no opportunity to dodge and were hit by the wave. But the happiness was short-lived as Takuma fell to the ground violently, missing the opportunity to do a roll to kill the momentum. Fortunately, his body was much stronger than a normal human. Unfortunately, he was in bad shape, and even the fall from a height that Takuma wouldn't feel in his knees sent a wave of weakness throughout his body. Takuma groaned, and before even attempting to get up, he weaved hand seals for eight tentacles through the pain. 
the water collected from the puddles and rain pulled together in front of his chest. Two tentacles sprouted out and wrapped around his legs. As he forced himself to stand up, the water blob moved from his front to his back before six more tentacles spread out. Each tentacle felt as heavy as lead. He knew his condition was worsening, and he didn't have enough time, his body would give out before he ran out of chakra. He heard footsteps, and when he looked up, the three assassins stood around him. That's the end of this tale for now. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in part 9. Peace.